Good morning to everyone here in person at our offices in Washington, D.C., and to those watching online from around the world. Welcome to the Center for a New American Security. My name is Anna Saito Carson, and I'm Vice President of Development and a member of the executive team at, here at CNAS. For those who aren't familiar with CNAS, we are an independent, bipartisan organization that develops strong, pragmatic, and principled national security and defense policies. CNAS engages policymakers, experts, and the public with our innovative, fact-based research, ideas, and analysis to shape and elevate the national security debate. A key part of our mission is to inform and prepare the national security leaders of today and tomorrow. I'm delighted that everyone can join us today. We are celebrating two milestones for this event. First, this year marks CNAS's 15th anniversary. This organization was founded in 2007 by Michelle Florinoy and Kurt Campbell. Names that are familiar to many of you here in Washington and around the world and online. And our mission to work in a bipartisan manner is even more relevant today as we tackle emerging national security challenges. And second, we are excited to host our first in-person public event since the beginning of the pandemic. Although we have adapted our research and programming to meet the challenges and opportunities posted by the pandemic, being back in person reminds us that there is no substitute for face-to-face -face exchanges. To that end, I would like to formally welcome our colleagues and co-hosts from the Prospect Foundation, a leading think tank in Taiwan, especially President Ai Chung Lai. CNAS has been proud to co-host several events over the years with the Prospect Foundation. We deeply value you as partners. Thank you very much. I would also like to thank our friends from TechRo who are here with us today for their support of CNAS. Your support makes our work possible. Thank you. Now this audience, both here in the room and online, knows well that today's program comes at a critical time in the cross-strait situation following House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan and Beijing's provocative and destabilizing military exercises in response. We are also watching closely as China prepares for the 20th Party Congress in October and various initiatives from the U.S. Indo-Pacific Economic Framework to the Quad to China's Global Security Initiative seek to shape the regional order in the Indo-Pacific and beyond. Now today's program will help us better understand those dynamics and chart the way forward. We will kick off with an address from Minister Tai Shan Chu, who leads Taiwan's Mainland Affairs Council. Unfortunately, the minister had to cancel his trip to Washington, but he has kindly provided a video address for us today. Following the official remarks, we'll take a short coffee break. Then we will hold an expert panel on the CCP's 20th Party Congress and its implications for U.S.-Taiwan-China relations which will be moderated by President Lai. Then we'll take a short lunch break, which will provide an opportunity for the in-person audience to conduct informal exchanges with their colleagues. And finally, we'll come back for a second panel assessing the new Indo-Pacific political economic order in the post-pandemic era. So as you can see, we have an exciting lineup today. So let's just jump right in. It is my great honor to introduce the virtual remarks of Minister Chu. Before assuming office as Minister of Taiwan's Mainland Affairs in February 2021, he served as Minister of Justice as well as 
deputy mayor of Taiwan, and Kaohsiung. He was elected twice to the legislative yuan, and in 2004, he became the deputy minister of the Mainland Affairs Council. A lawyer by trade, Minister Chu has also taught at Asia University and served on Taiwan's National Security Council. Now, please direct your attention for those who are in person to the screen at the front of the room for Minister Chu's remarks. After the video is finished, we will take a short break before reconvening around 10, 10 a.m. Eastern time for the first panel. Thank you very much. Vice President Anna Saito Carson of Center for a New American Security, President Lai of Prospect Foundation, distinguished scholars and experts, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. The Mainland Affairs Council is pleased to entrust the Prospect Foundation to organize today's event. And we are grateful for the efforts of our local co-host, CNES, that has made today's symposium possible. I deeply regret not being able to address you in person due to some urgent matters in Taiwan, but I want you to know that it is truly an honor of mine to be able to speak with all of you today. Today, we are witnessing a long-term trend of changing and unease internationally and in the Asia-Pacific region. I would like to share some thoughts and talk a bit about the cross-trade policy position of the ROC government. First, Beijing has become a destabilizing factor in the Taiwan Strait amid global upheavals. Over the past two years, COVID-US-China relations, the Russian-Ukrainian war, and the global trade situation have caused upheavals. This manifold and the synergized impacts not only have disrupted global economic development and the supply chains, but also have sharply heightened concerns and the unease among countries on traditional and non-traditional security issues. They are also affecting patterns that are already changing in the Asia-Pacific regime. In early August, amid the ongoing Russian-Ukrainian war, the authorities of the Chinese Communist Party abruptly launched a series of target military exercises and implemented economic laws to pressure Taiwan. It shifted policy based on assessment of the situation, changing the original, regional order and the status quo of the Taiwan Strait. This is not just about the CCP realizing its Taiwan policy and the all historic mission. Beijing's strategic intention is to use the full spectrum of China's ascendant strength, strengths to dominate the direction of the international order through coercion at a time of change. It also wants to accelerate the reversal restrictions imposed on is under the existing order. It is also increasingly likely to extend this to the East China Sea, South China Sea, and the entire Indo-Pacific to create an irreversible trend and stir regional instability. This is a very serious warning. Second, the essence of cross-strait relations is peace and equality. Sovereign democracy cannot be violated. Cross-strait relations are the key to building security and prosperity 
in the Indo-Pacific region. Over the past 70 years, the two sides of the Taiwan Strait have lived under different systems and shifted their relationship from military confrontation to exchange and interaction. Now, once again, the CCP threatens to resolve differences by force. Taiwan has faced up to the CCP regime. Beijing has long refused to face the fact of the AOC's existence and the democracy and the free will of Taiwan's 23 million people. Herein lies a crux of the problem that have prevented the resolution of the cross-trade political impasse. This is also the essential problem in cross-trade relations. The CCP hopes to fast-track reunification. However, it has from in the face of the facts, international law and the principle of peace in international relations through its appropriate behavior and speech on the Taiwan Strait over the years. First, it misquotes the UN Charter with its distorted One China principle and deliberately misinterpreted interpret UNGA Resolution 2758 to claim sovereignty over Taiwan. In fact, Taiwan, Pengfu, Jinmen, and Mazu have never been governed by the People Republic of China. Second, China refused to renounce the use of force and is trying to resolve cross-trade issues through a civil war. This, viol this violates the principle of maintaining peace and uh, prohibiting the use of force under the UN Charter. Taiwan, by comparison, lifted martial law and stopped treating the CCP as a rebel group in 1991. Third, China's military exercises near Taiwan encroach on our sovereignty, undermine regional security and seriously affect international aviation, shipping, and trade. They violate the UN Convention on the Law of Sea, coastal peace and the order, and the right of coastal states. The CCP is not only expounding military actions in the Taiwan Strait, but also contravening the tested security understanding of the median line of the Taiwan Strait set by the U.S. and observed by both sides of the Taiwan Strait for over half a century. This gravely strengthens the security interest of all parties concerned. The international community should no longer ignore the CCP's constant challenge to and undermine of the international order and the rules. Third, Taiwan will not act provoca provocatively or rashly and will join safeguard peace across the Taiwan Strait with the international community. Security across Taiwan Strait is conducive to peace and the prosperity in East Asia. The AOC government has always been committed to maintaining the status quo in the Taiwan Strait. In the six past years since taking office, President Tsai has firmly upheld the principle of handling cross-strait relations, pragmatically maintaining rational restraint without provocation and standing firm without backing down. We will not escalate military confrontation, not harm the right and the interest of any country or people, and not destabilize the regional situation. However, 
we do not accept any so-called political strategy or institutional arrangement that dissolves Taiwan and violates sovereignty. Taiwan continues strengthening its self-defense, contributing its technology advantages, and also promoting the normal operation of international trade and the secure supply chains. This all demonstrate the indomitable uh, tenacity of Taiwan, an island of resilience. We thank the U.S. and the democratic countries around the world for their support for Taiwan through their su sustained attention to peace and justice in the Taiwan Strait, in line with the Taiwan Relations Act and the, the six assurances, and with firm congressional support, the U.S. government has helped Taiwan build up national defense capability. Initiated bilateral trade negotiation and the deepened investment cooperation, we hope that the international community will realize that mainland China is amassing considerable energy to counter the international power structure and the steadily encroaching on infiltrating and changing the autonomous operation of democracies through ideological and cognitive warfare. Today, we count on all countries to unite more strongly in urging China to show rational restraint and adjust its practices. We also need to prevent improper and illegal coercion from being normalized as a result of our neglect or compromise. Only then can we ensure peace and prosperity in the Taiwan Strait and the Indo-Pacific region. Fourth, cross-strait political differences should be peaceful resolved. The CCP is intentionally fanning regional tensions with negative repercussions. I would like to make a few comments in hopes of easing the current situation in the Taiwan Strait. First, an old proverb goes strength with arrogance convince no one. We call on the leadership in Beijing to deal with differences with an open and reformed oriented attitude. It cannot use cross-strait peace and regional stability as bargaining chips to achieve modern governance or become a responsible power worthy of emulation. Second, people centrism should be the main concern in managing and controlling risks across the Taiwan Strait. The CCP cannot even talk about a shared mindset if it is unable to stop its harmful pressuring of Taiwan or ex exercise restraint on the internal negative factors depleting peace in the Taiwan Strait. Third, we urge Beijing to communicate pragmatically to reduce misunderstanding and the misjudgment between the two sides of the Taiwan Strait and to prevent the situation in the Taiwan Strait from descending into an uncontrollable crisis. This foundation should be rooted in equality and dignity facing each other without preconditions and with consideration to the shared responsibility of safeguarding people's well-being and peace across 
the Taiwan Strait. Fourth, all sides have an interest in the security of the Taiwan Strait. Taiwan has a strategic, strategic importance based on its democratic systems and values. This is the basis of our sustainable existence. It is also the responsible conduct that can st stabilize currently complex and changing situation, a vibrant, resilient, and democratic Taiwan is a strategic asset. As the situation develops, Taiwan will, as always, activity, activity participate and contribute its strengths in international affairs and regional governance. We look forward to the U.S. and the international community strengthening exchanges and interactions with Taiwan bilaterally and multilaterally as to make Taiwan better connected, better informed, and better positioned. Thank you for listening. I wish the symposium a complete success. The United States faces a challenge like no other in its history, a strategic competition with a rising China. Technology is at the center of this competition. Leaders who can harness technology for economic, political and military power will have an outsized influence on shaping our world. America needs a national technology strategy to drive innovation, mitigate risk and compete for security and prosperity. But America cannot compete alone. The U.S. approach to technology must involve partnering with like-minded countries. America benefits from a network of allies and partners, including the world's top technology and economic leaders, and it must capitalize on this advantage. A technology alliance is the best way for tech-leading democracies to work together on big issues such as groundbreaking research and development, securing supply chains, and defending technology norms rooted in democratic values. The core group should include the world's tech-leading democracies. These countries should engage on technologies such as artificial intelligence, 5G telecommunications, semiconductors, and energy storage. And they should engage on issues including standard setting, export controls, and investment reviews. To do this well, stakeholders from industry and civil society should have a seat at the table. If tech-leading democracies fail to work together, they're unlikely to win the global competition. At stake is the ability to shape a democratic technological future. Collaborating with partners and allies matters because the countries that adopt new technologies and shape their use will write the future rules of the road. A technology alliance of democratic countries will empower citizens, compete economically, 
and help states protect their security, all without having to compromise shared values or national sovereignty. Tech-leading democracies need to form an alliance to ensure that the future of innovation is inclusive, prosperous and secure. China overall seeks to carve out a new kind of global sphere of influence and to profoundly shape the 21st century. The Belt and Road is really a key tool by which China is pursuing this vision. It started out initially with a focus on mostly hard infrastructure, things like ports, railways. It has migrated more and more to have a digital focus that includes everything from undersea cables to facial recognition software to smart cities and telecommunications networks, 5G and more. What this technology or these new technologies really do is concentrate a lot of power in the hands of one body. So it essentially enables authoritarian governments to do what they do best, enforce control over their populations. The phrase they like to use is internet sovereignty. And what that means is that a country's sovereignty, like its borders, that's the writ of the state. As it relates to information, they wanna have tight control over communications and media. They have been able to keep information away from the Chinese people as well as control information. And now they can monitor information and punish people who say things, not to their liking, and that, of course, has a huge chilling effect uh, across all sorts of civil society. For authoritarian states, the cost of repressing their citizens is going down, but then for countries that maybe are democratic or at least not autocratic, there's much more temptation to move in an autocratic direction, and there's a lot of resources and technology coming from China to make that happen. These nations with authoritarian leanings are going to be made in the Chinese image if they both have the, the technological blueprints and the laws and the policies that govern the use of this technology. While I wouldn't say data is necessarily the new oil, it is a, it's a precious commodity that the Chinese government has realized that they need more of and different kinds of. The Chinese government's actually been maybe surprisingly candid about its vision for the internet. And as its companies become more and more embedded in the uh, information technology ecosystems of developing countries. It has more leverage over them, it moves their systems toward its model. To be clear, I think the United States and its allies and partners have many opportunities to ensure that the kind of dark future that I've been painting does not emerge. But if we fail, the stakes are incredibly high. I think when you look at how the 21st century will play out, despite setbacks, this was a century in which overall freedom and democracy advanced or not. To me, this question of kind of China's high-tech liberalism will really drive that answer.
The People's Bank of China, China's central bank, is developing the digital yuan, the first digital version of a fiat currency from a major economy. The digital yuan will likely strengthen the Chinese Communist Party's domestic digital authoritarianism. As countries look for models to manage central bank money, Beijing's digital yuan will bring about new standards in the global financial system that risk privacy and governance principles. So far, we know that the digital yuan system will have a two-tier structure, with the central bank managing the back end and state banks and private companies facilitating everyday transactions. It will not be blockchain-based. The most groundbreaking and alarming feature of the digital yuan is controllable anonymity, which allows China's central bank to see nearly all real-time transactions. China's central bank wants to harness the market share and technological innovation of private firms and gain direct access to Chinese consumers' financial data. It aims to shape monetary policy, monitor illegal activity, and curb corruption. The Chinese Communist Party will likely leverage the system to surveil Chinese citizens. The digital yuan system would make it easier for the party to cut off financial access of any individual. Pilot tests have been underway since mid-2020. If successful, China may gain an edge over the United States in financial technology innovation. China will make the digital yuan available for wider use during the Beijing Winter Olympics in February 2022. U.S. policymakers must address the digital yuan's potential to further Beijing's coercive power and influence in the global financial system. America must adapt to the evolving payments space, counter the digital yuan's threats to political and economic liberty, and ensure that innovation in financial technology does not advance China's digital authoritarianism. The United States faces a challenge like no other in its history, a strategic competition with a rising China. Technology is at the center of this competition. Leaders who can harness technology for economic, political and military power will have an outsized influence on shaping our world. America needs a national technology strategy to drive innovation, mitigate risk and compete for security and prosperity. But America cannot compete alone. The U.S. approach to technology must involve partnering with like-minded countries. 
America benefits from a network of allies and partners, including the world's top technology and economic leaders, and it must capitalize on this advantage. A technology alliance is the best way for tech-leading democracies to work together on big issues such as groundbreaking research and development, securing supply chains, and defending technology norms rooted in democratic values. The core group should include the world's tech-leading democracies. These countries should engage on technologies such as artificial intelligence, 5G telecommunications, semiconductors, and energy storage. And they should engage on issues including standard setting, export controls, and investment reviews. To do this well, stakeholders from industry and civil society should have a seat at the table. If tech-leading democracies fail to work together, they're unlikely to win the global competition. At stake is the ability to shape a democratic technological future. Collaborating with partners and allies matters because the countries that adopt new technologies and shape their use will write the future rules of the road. A technology alliance of democratic countries will empower citizens, compete economically, and help states protect their security, all without having to compromise share Foundation. Uh, just as the uh, Vice President uh, Carson said, uh, the, this is the CNAS uh, first uh, in-person event, but this is also the Prospect Foundation first in-person visit uh, and event in Washington, D.C. after the pandemic. So for me, that's a very excited, and we are also honored uh, to have this event with CNAS. And this session uh, it's about the uh, TCP's 20th uh, Party Congress and its implication to U.S.-Taiwan-China relationship. Uh, we all know that the uh, CCP's uh, National Congress is always important uh, for foreign observers uh, to assess about the future trajectory of the China policy, domestic or foreign. But this time, uh, it's particularly uh, interesting is that the people expected that uh, the leadership would assume the third terms uh, that is the first time since the, uh, 1982, for almost like 30 or 40 years. And uh, with that, uh, especially uh, with the current economic situation that in China has, we do know that the, when Xi Jinping assumed office uh, since year 2013, uh, the Chinese economy growth uh, has been dropping uh, year by year. And so that uh, we no longer expected that a double digits growth like uh, during the, the early, tw uh, early 21st century, during the Hu Jintao's time. Uh, and with the uh, decreasing of the economic momentum, uh, there's a real possibility whether that is a structural issue or uh, some people tended to argue that uh, this is such a maturity of the economy. But we do not know what is going on. But another important issue is that uh, with the third term of the Xi Jinping and uh, that how that will impact the whole elite politics within China and especially uh, with the invasion of Ukraine earlier this year by Russia and Putin, and when people were starting to ask that uh, with a similar uh, ruling structures between China and Russia, will Xi Jinping sort out the redux of the Putin himself? And how would that uh, affect his foreign policies? So with that in mind, that uh, uh, we are very excited to have uh, two distinguished uh, experts uh, in this field. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce the uh, Dr. Arthur Dean, Professor Arthur Dean, um, right on my left, uh, he is the renowned expert in Taiwan for the POA as well as the China, uh, Chinese elite politics. And then uh, following an Arthur Dean uh, will be the, uh, uh, Mr. Jacob Stokes. He's a fellow at the Indo-Pacific Security Program of the CNS. So that uh, without further ado, an Arthur, please, the floor is yours. You have eight minutes. Oh. <laughs> 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 okay, uh, first of First of all, thanks for the invitation uh, by Perspect Foundation and uh, CNES, and the league to join the organize this event. Uh, the topic assigned to me is about the, to make a, a assessment or reasonable spe speculation what after the Chinese Party Congress. So um, probably let's start from uh, to see what have been changed in the past 10 decades in Xi Jinping's first two, first two terms. It's no doubt, you know, uh, he consulted all the power, and uh, even we can say he personalized all the power in his hand. We all know that he's the chairman of all kinds of uh, 
uh, CCP Central Commission in finance, in economics, in cybersecurity, in even so-called military uh, uh, defense fusion uh, uh, commission, so and so forth. So apparently, you know, uh, he consulted, he, uh, he centralized all power in his hand. And uh, to some extent, he really personalized power in, in his hand. No. So that is the, uh, the what we see, what uh, we call the, the power structure. No. He's, he becomes the, the only leader uh, 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 of the CCP. So what are his colleagues at the Politburo Standing Committee member? They all become his deputies. For instance, uh, uh, in internal regulation, I guess you all read, uh, you, you all read before that the, all the Politburo member need to are required to report his his work to Xi Jinping to 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 to, to, to Xi Jinping. So uh, that means that the you know the uh, he become the supreme leader uh, uh, of the CCP and the, and in China and uh, all the so called the uh, other uh, colleagues at the Politburo Standing Committee or Politburo, they all have been uh, marginalized their power. Uh, so there's no more so-called uh, collective uh, uh, leadership and a division of labor, because uh, collective leadership and division of labor was said by Deng Xiaoping. We all know after the Cultural Revolution. Uh, so uh, this kind of design, it tried to deflect, diffuse power. So uh, uh, power will not be concentrated in single person hand. Uh, so if that is the case, then what can we take in his certain? Will he will he share power with his colleague? It's totally, it's totally, it's totally almost impossible, right? It's quite absurd, you know, if he shares his power with colleagues. So uh, so this kind of a uh, he will continue to be so-called supreme leader. Uh, even aging, you know, these days all kind of rumors say new member will be selected to join the uh, uh, PBSC Politburo Standing Committee member. But as I said, you know, uh, those old colleagues have been marginalized. How can you expect new members of PBSC can have some kind of influence, right? So. Uh, uh, so my conclusion is that any new member, either to the Blue Bureau or PBSC, does not make any, uh, uh, will not change anything. Uh, so that is the, the basic structure after the, uh, so called after the party Congress. Uh, so uh, the, uh, will he, you know, and if he enter his third term, will he change policy? Probably not, because we all that we all know that in the past two decades, uh, SOE self enterprise, so called Bo Jing, in the economic speaking, probably the sector has been declined. And uh, particularly, I guess this is the most important. Those uh, very inno innovative uh, 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 businessmen like Jack Ma, or or the uh, the leader of the Tencent, another Ma, right? Uh, they have been set under the in the under, in the name of so-called anti-monopoly. So if you are Jack Ma and you are invited by Xi Jinping, say Jack, please come back. Let's work together and revitalize our economy. Will you have confidence or not? This is a very criti critical question. My conclusion is that Xi Jinping will become the, the only barrier for China economy in the next century. Because if you are Jack Ma, how can you have confidence, right? You have been sad, and uh, you are not allowed to speak, right? Look, so many so-called top rank businessmen that they try to early retire, retire early. What happens? So means that those top rank meet a business leadership, they don't have confidence. So they have to, it's better for them to retire early, to enjoy the rest of their life, right? Uh, so that is the, the very critical uh, question. So if that is the case, uh, we all know that uh, in political science, the legitimacy for uh, authoritarian uh, leader is that 
they can provide economic growth and economic welfare. But if Xi Jinping himself becomes the only barrier, and you cannot take the, the so-called economic growth and the economic welfare, then how can he boost his own legitimacy? So this has become a critical question. Uh, so probably another way is to help to boost his legitimacy, probably again, rely on the nationalism. Then so-called the great rejuvenation, then the question is how can you prove that? So this is, a, I would say, quite a, 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 a critical. Another, so this, I'm saying that the, my own case is that the, in his third terms, uh, there probably is a kind of a, 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 a agreed by many people in Taiwan say that, that it's very likely for Xi Jinping to launch kind of a great long operation. You know. uh, why that? Because uh, we all know that uh, Xi Jinping becomes the supreme leader. And uh, if he did not achieve progress on Taiwan issue, then after five years, after he finished his third term, he will be perceived as a failed leader. Then, if he is perceived fair leader, he will lose faith. But on the other hand, if he, he makes some kind of progress, I don't know how to define progress, frankly speaking, then he can have he can probably can stay on another fourth term, right? Because such a uh, achievement, Taiwan at least unified cannot be uh, uh, reversed. Probably I don't know. Then he can stay on another term, the fourth term. So I think the, uh, this is the third term for him is quite critical for his so-called uh, uh, legacy and uh, for his status in whole CCP history. Uh, so this, he's very likely to launch the so-called gray zone operation. Yeah, uh, uh, we all know that the, the war, you know, is uh, quite a great uh, catastrophic uh, damage, but. At least, great zone operation, I, I get from Xi Jinping's mindset, uh, it will take tremendous time, but will not create a, at least so called so catastrophic uh, damage for Taiwan and for, for China, Southeast Coast. So, probably for him, the great zone uh, operation should be uh, <coughs> uh, 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 feasible and uh, feasible, feasible approach. Uh, so. The question is, if he launched the great zone operation, then under the Taiwan Relations Act, under the so-called uh, six assurance and other kind of commitment, then I don't know, I, I have no idea how the United States will respond at that time. So then, but probably U.S. should make some kind of response, I don't know. So. Uh, in that kind of a context, the tension definitely will, will increase, definitely will, will increase. And uh, to make so-called uh, US-Taiwan-China relation will become more complex. So my conclusion is that, the, you know, uh, as a supreme leader, he cannot veto his previous policy, right? He cannot give up the Bo Xinmin trade because private sector has no confidence at all. Uh, he cannot uh, walk back from so-called uh, warrior uh, uh, diplomacy, warrior diplomacy, because to some extent warrior diplomacy reflects so-called great rejuvenation. China can speak up, China can stay up uh, with the United States, with all the other so-called traditional Western countries. So my conclusion is that the uh, uh, then she will become more powerful, probably become more powerful than, than before, uh, with a power almost uh, on par with Chairman Mao, probably. And the second, a certain will be for him give you a tremendous pressure on Taiwan issue. As I said earlier, if he didn't achieve any kind of progress, then he will be perceived as a failed leader. So he had to do something, uh, working hard, Aggressively, or whatever we can uh, single. So
so that he, uh, he can achieve something, then this inevitably will create more tension and uh, a complex, complex situation in the town trade. So, um, and then I guess he will push and push and uh, create more tension in the town trade and uh, hold the so called make the US Taiwan China relation will become more uh, complex. So, probably I'll stop here. Thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Arthur, for your uh, remarks. I think uh, you touched several important points. Uh, first of all is that the uh, uh, Xi Jinping's policy, the third term, probably will be continuation on the first and second term because if it is not, then that will be a self-violating uh, his own rule and uh, uh, will uh, delegitimize uh, his uh, standings. And second of all is that uh, uh, for Xi to uh, assume his third term, then the whole structure within this uh, political central standing committee as well as political bureau probably will be different. Uh, all of them will be his deputies. Uh, then the, he will assume a semi like um, a, a chairman like uh, positions like a Mao Zedong. But the third, you also indicate that uh, the third terms of the Xi Jinping could be um, a very interesting period that uh, either Xi Jinping want, need to do something uh, drastic in order to secure uh, his position so that he can continue for the fourth terms. Then some uh, I issue on Taiwan and probably will be pushed uh, to the uh, front burner as well as the, uh, the actions on Taiwan. Uh, but you also mentioned uh, probably that will be the great zone operations, but high end of great zone operation, I, I, I suppose. But uh, you also mentioned another thing that I think probably we could also dive into. That is, when you start to compare with Mao Zedong and Xi Jinping, Mao Zedong launched the, uh, the, the hot war against Taiwan uh, in 1954 and 1958. And there was also another uh, conflict in 1962. But the Mao Zedong later on also is the one that uh, said that the, uh, the Taiwan issue can be delayed for another 50 years or, so, or even 100 years uh, when he needed to. Uh, that is, the Mao Zedong has a, a rival power on himself. So that which one will emerge? Or the, uh, what kind of dynamic will actually come out? That's another uh, interesting when we do the historical comparisons. So I just laid out here and I'd like to invite um, <coughs> Jeff Stokes uh, for your remarks. Thank you. Considering the topic of this panel, I came up with sort of five key questions that I think will shape outcomes for U.S., Taiwan, China relations uh, around the 20th Party Congress and into Xi Jinping's likely third term. Uh, my remarks will go through each of those five questions briefly. The first question is simply, what exactly is the environment going into the 20th Party Congress? Of course, there's security tensions following Speaker Pelosi's visit, China's unprecedented response, and the PRC's uh, issuance of a Taiwan policy white paper, uh, the first such paper released during Xi Jinping's time in office. Uh, in essence, Beijing is pursuing a new normal, uh, normalizing air and maritime patrols across the median line in the Taiwan Strait, conducting in general a greater number and type of patrols all around Taiwan, including with unmanned aircraft or drones and on the east side of Taiwan. And China has now set a precedent for shooting missiles over Taiwan, even though uh, in this most recent instance, they were high above the Earth's atmosphere. At the same time, as Professor Ding uh, laid out uh, very eloquently, we see mounting domestic challenges for China and Xi Jinping. Uh, what was supposed to be Xi Jinping's dream year, uh, 2022, has turned into something of a nightmare. The toll of uh, dynamic Good, okay, uh, thanks. Uh, the toll of dynamic COVID zero on China's economy uh, and its people has been huge. 33 cities in China are currently under full or partial lockdown. We see a real estate crisis that's reverberating through the financial system and hitting the bottom line or balance sheets of uh, regular families who put their savings into real estate. We've also seen historic droughts and related energy problems, and that's all before the Sichuan earthquake of recent days. That sort of leads us to question two, which we've been talking about. What, what exactly is likely to happen at the 20th Party Congress? As Chung Li at the Brookings Institution has noted, there's both less and more uncertainty than in previous Congresses. There's less uncertainty at the top, at the general secretary level. Xi Jinping will almost surely get a third term, as we've been discussing. And from what we can tell, Xi's opponents have become more vocal, only as they get more marginalized or further from power in the CCP system. 
uh, we can only, or we can look to former uh, Central Party School professor Kai Xia's essay in the current issue of Foreign Affairs, uh, which says as much. But there's also more uncertainty regarding which officials below the level of CCP General Secretary will get a pass on age limits and where the shuffle could lead them. Uh, as we look at foreign policy in particular, there was likely to be notable changes to foreign policy officials as Politburo member and director of the Office of the Foreign Affairs Commission, Yang jae will step down, and potentially State Counselor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi will have to step down if indeed uh, age restrictions are applied to him as well. So there's that open question below Xi Jinping of who exactly will fill those roles that affect Taiwan policy as well as foreign policy from the Politburo Standing Committee on down, in addition to this question of how does the, the senior leadership relate uh, to Xi mm -hmm. the governing system. Which leads to question three. Uh, will Xi Jinping become more or less aggressive after the 20th Party Congress? Now, these types of events defy prediction, in my view, so I won't offer specific forecasts. Um, that said, as analysts, we can examine trends and interpretations that might drive events towards different scenarios. I see three broad possibilities. My base case, or what I uh, see as the most likely outcome, uh, is that I expect there to be more continuity than change following the 20th Party Congress. That is, I expect we'll continue to see a steady but incremental and controlled rise in China's pressure targeting Taiwan. But there's also a second case, a case for significant escalation. Here, one could argue that Xi Jinping has consolidated power to an unprecedented degree and feels he can now take additional risk in pursuit of ambitious goals uh, that he sees as vital to securing his legacy in the pantheon of Chinese leaders. He might feel that the growth of China's military and economic power means Beijing is increasingly tr uh, prepared to try to force the issue. Simultaneously, whether because of challenges with China's growth model, uh, its demographics, or other reasons, perhaps the, the military balance in the Taiwan <coughs> Strait and others, uh, China could see a closing window of opportunity and then therefore see the need uh, to act sooner rather than later. And it's also possible that uh, the domestic politics reasons uh, my colleagues mentioned could play into this scenario as well in driving forward uh, more aggressive behavior from Xi Jinping in China. The third scenario is less likely, but it is possible. There's at least a plausible case that we'll see measured de-escalation coming out of the 20th Party Congress. Now, to be clear, any easing of tensions would likely be tactical and temporary. Uh, we would not expect a change in Beijing's long-term goals for Taiwan. Still, for this scenario, we might interpret the intensity of China's response to P Speaker Pelosi's visit as being in part driven by the sensitivity of the political moment uh, in Beijing in the late, or late summer, early uh, fall, which will have passed after the 20th Party Congress, and especially if Xi Jinping um, you know, reifies his hold on power. Moreover, we're seeing Xi Jinping return to foreign travel after several years in China um, uh, dealing with the pandemic, uh, starting with Central Asia in the coming weeks, and then to Indonesia in November for the G20 summit. And that could expose him to views outside of his tight-knit cabal of advisors, views that might urge more restraint and underscore the negative effects China's aggression is having on Beijing's reputation and arguably its interests around the world. This leads me to question four. What future developments could spark more cross-strait tensions or crises? Uh, I think the most immediate on the horizon that I see in Washington is, is the Taiwan Policy Act um, and other future congressional action on Taiwan policy. This is a significant bill introduced by Senators Menendez and Graham, although it's still in the relatively early stages, it's still in the committee. Um, and as always, as that bill evolves, it'll be critical to prioritize substance over symbolism, but it'll be interesting to see what comes out uh, in future versions. Then we have the 2024 presidential elections and the campaign cycles leading up to them, both in Taiwan and in the United States. Uh, this audience will know well that cross-strait issues played an important role in President Tsai's re-election in 2020, and China and Taiwan issues in the U.S. context are becoming more salient in American politics every year, seemingly. There's also probably an unexpected crisis in the offing. We won't know the exact timing, but we can surmise that a greater number of close-in PLA military operations around Taiwan raises the risk of an accident or miscalculation that could spiral into crisis. 
I worry most uh, just personally about a military crisis that overlaps or happens simultaneously with a political crisis because I think the combination of those, those two things happening concurrently could create a set of dynamics that would make off-ramps or de-escalation or ex escalation hard to manage um, in the first place. And that leads me to question five. You know, what should Washington, Taipei, and like-minded partners do about all this? For, I think the first and most obvious step is additional military preparations to improve the cross-strait balance and bolster deterrence. We saw last week the Biden administration notified Congress of its intent to sell Taiwan $1.1 billion worth of arms. That was the fifth and largest arms sale during the Biden administration so far. Implementation will be a challenge, though, as the U.S. defense industrial base tries to catch up with demand, especially given the need in Ukraine. We've also uh, seen Taiwan's proposed 14 percent or nearly 14 percent increase in defense spending, which would bring its spending to GDP ratio to 2.4 percent, well above uh, the NATO target of 2 percent. That's a welcome development, and I think a move in the, in the right direction, uh, but there's probably more to be done given the level, level of the threat. And then more broadly, we need to double down on our commitment to an implementation of a truly asymmetric posture. And then we need also need to think about how to address wear and tear on Taiwan's military that comes as a result of responding to PLA intrusions. Next, we need to do more on economic and financial deterrence. We need to make clear the economic cost of a cross-strait contingency and various cross-strait contingencies, as, as was discussed earlier, not just in terms of sanctions and what the, the US, Taiwan, and like-minded allies could do in terms of direct economic punishments, but also by mapping out the broader fallout of a contingency for the regional and global economies. Interestingly, uh, last month, Nikkei Asia reported on a study conducted by China's Ministry of Public Security and Ministry of State Security that found an astronomical 2.6 uh, trillion, trillion with a T, could evaporate from the global economy as a result of a Taiwan contingency. Now, of course, that would probably be a full-scale one, but, but the number is pretty staggering. We also need more work on contingency planning. We need more extensive consultations about handling uh, gray zone challenges from Beijing, especially those activities that might be called, uh, seem to be in the dark gray or charcoal zone. That is, those still in the gray zone, but closer to war than peace. And here, time would be a critical factor in any cross-strait contingency. So the more we can think through things in advance, the better off we'll be. For example, it only takes four minutes for a PLA fighter aircraft that has crossed the median line to reach Taiwan's coastline. Uh, that's not a lot of time to think about uh, exactly what's going on and, and how to respond. Lastly, and for me this is the most important one, is we need political steadiness and restraint. If ultimately the goal of U.S. policy, and, and for others as well, we heard it from the minister, is the maintenance of, cross, of the cross-strait status quo along with peace and stability, then political steadiness and restraint should be the guiding principle for our actions. For the United States, this means keeping what's left of strategic ambiguity and holding fast to the U.S.'s one China policy, even with uh, its uh, you know, complexities and, and some might argue even contradictions. Doing so isn't some concession to China or Xi Jinping by any means. It's instead about making sure our commitment to upholding the status quo is credible with, with other countries, would-be partners in Europe, the Indo-Pacific, countries like Singapore and Vietnam that want to re remain more neutral. And in doing so, we can keep the focus on China's destabilizing actions that are upending the status quo and help avoid a narrative about both sides uh, driving tensions and more keep the focus on China. So I will wrap it up there. Thanks for listening, and I look forward to the Q&A. Thank you, Jacob, uh, for your remarks. <coughs> and I think that, uh, anybody hear me? Yeah. I think the, uh, what you mentioned about the five uh, questions or five points that you, uh, you, that you had, uh, one of them is uh, particularly uh, interesting in my mind. That is, uh, you sort of indicate that the uh, Chinese economic momentum is slowing down, or the, uh, the challenges actually facing. But then uh, last year, the Xi Jinping the public uh, talked about the, uh, the, the rise of the East and the uh, decline of the West, and sort of indicates that he has a very different worldview uh, in the uh, assessment, uh, what you presented, or not just you, but uh, also the, a lot of others have the, the, uh, the somewhat dimmer outlook for the Chinese new, uh, future development. So that w uh, with those two different uh, expectations about Chinese future, and also the uh, very different uh, predictions regarding how the other might react. 
Uh, I think that dynamics, uh, especially in terms of the uh, 20th uh, National Congress of the CCP, uh, how would that add up to the, the, the decision, uh, the leadership, their decisions about the interpretation of the other side? Because I do hear uh, is, uh, the, uh, the interesting reading is that the current U.S. and other Western countries, their uh, economic uh, or the trade warfare against China is because of they are so weak and they're so fearful about the resurgence of China. So and they uh, wanted to preempt from, uh, to do something uh, to uh, prevent China from rising above them. Yeah. So that definitely is something that uh, we, uh, interesting uh, interpretation, but that would lead to a very different dynamics as we foresee. Um, so t uh, enough for my uh, murmuring <laughs> here. Uh, just like to uh, uh, invite our audience here uh, to raise question. Yes, Susan, you always come the first, please. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so Susan Lawrence. Yeah, please pass the mic uh, to our Honorable Susan Lawrence uh, from the Thank you very much, Services. Susan Lawrence, Congressional Research Service. Thank you very much for this panel. Thank you for doing this in-person event. It's very exciting to be here in person. Um, Arthur, you were talking about how you thought Xi Jinping, or the Chinese leadership, would be most likely to approach Taiwan using gray zone tactics rather than trying to launch a war. Can you give us a bit more information about what you see as likely gray zone tactics? What does that look like if it's a gray zone approach to Taiwan? Thank you. Uh, do we have other questions? I'd like to collect probably uh, uh, one more of them uh, from the audience. If not, OK, then the, uh, the author, please. All right. Uh, this is uh, quite uh, a popular topic these days, uh, probably in Taiwan. Uh, for instance, uh, 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 we all know Taiwan heavily rely on the international trade. And uh, we import tremendous uh, LNG, uh, liquid natural gas, and oil, so and so forth. So uh, you know, this one scenario, what if the, uh, uh, in the South China Sea, they uh, interdict a, a Taiwan's LNG ship, for instance, or some kind of uh, uh, the Coast Guard approaching to our LNG ship, so and so forth. Uh, so then uh, they don't need to stop, but just you know they send a, a, a rumors say, okay, the Taiwan's LNG ship was inspected, was stopped by by Coast Guard. You know? so this kind of rumors they can kind of psychologically try to impact our, and create some kind of paranoia uh, domestically in Taiwan. So this is one of the scenario. You know, we 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 talk a lot about you know in, in domestic in Taiwan. So this is probably is one of the so-called gray zone. Yeah. Any other examples? Uh, 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 yeah. Most recent is about the the UAVs. You know, the uh, you probably the red media from report. They sent all kinds of UAV to our the, the offshore islands, uh, and they took all kinds of photos and and the release in their uh, 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 WeChat, you know, uh, and uh, because I would say uh, because our some kind of self restraint, and uh, I heard some of those soldiers who who are photo, you know, uh, they are actually in in, in their vocation, you know, uh, not on the duties. Uh, so they didn't take any kind of actions. But, you know, uh, this kind of a create a tremendous debate domestically in Taiwan. Uh, are we, uh, are we do, do we give sufficient training to our soldier or not? Do our soldier follow the rule of engagement or not? Uh, so this kind of a, uh, and uh, the worst is that uh, uh, you lose confidence to our soldiers, you know. So this kind of psychological uh, effect domestically in Taiwan. So this probably is another way of the, you know. Uh, so so uh, I didn't try. I didn't try to give a definite definition of the, uh, the so-called gray zone because it's quite broad. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. And other question from the audience. I like to privilege. Okay, Matt, show that. Uh, please give me your. Uh, the uh, uh, institution that you're affiliated with? Uh, sure, of course. Uh, Matt Schrader with the International Republican Institute. Mm -hmm. I, actually, the question I had was sort of a continuation of Susan's and your answer. Um, after Speaker Pelosi's visit, 
there were um, you know interdiction zones around the island and there was a lot of discussion uh, in media inside and outside China that this was sort of a, a practice run for a, a blockade of the island um, I, this is actually a question for for both of you I'm curious about this or all three panelists really is um, how ready do we think Taiwan is for uh, this would be like a deep charcoal tactic, like something like the PRC takes custody of Taiwan's seagoing trade. Like we're going to throw a cordon around the island. We're going to, you know, inspect all the ships coming in and out or give ourselves the right to inspect all the ships coming in and out. And they only get to go in and out with our permission. Um, you know, something like that that's not like a, a even really a kinetic escalation like with a true blockade, but like sort of a soft blockade. Um, you know, how well prepared do we think the island is for, for something like that? Because that's pretty well in keeping with what we've seen in the Xi era of just kind of, you know, the salami slicing tactics of escalations, like in the South China Sea. You don't go right to pulling the trigger. You go to something that's very difficult for somebody else to respond to. Uh, so I'm just curious what you guys think of the readiness in a scenario like that. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> So first author, uh, they say two. So I always, always ask uh, Jacob to uh, come into uh, the discussion. Me, yeah. I'll save it for later. Okay. <laughs> right. Yeah, it, 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 it really is quite a challenge uh, to prepare for that kind of uh, 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 operation for Taiwan. Uh, 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 because um, on the one hand, you know, uh, we, ca we, we should avoid to escalate the tension, you know. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, uh, we have to uh, 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 deter or repel uh, uh, China this kind of uh, 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 action. Uh, I, I really don't know how our, you know, the, uh, uh, national security community, uh, political decision makers, communities. How how are they going to think of think about those kind of a, a, a scenario? Uh, but I guess, uh, but there's one probably uh, uh, one uh, issue that the uh, I would say certain uh, uh, because uh, those commercial cargoes, you know, when they come to to this region, you know, they not just go to Taiwan. They also go to Shanghai, go to Seoul, go to Tokyo. So once, my point is that once tension rise in that regions, all the insurance premium all goes up. So not just Taiwan get hurt, China also get hurt, Japan probably also get hurt, and the South Korea also probably get hurt. So I would say this kind of a, a, a chain reaction, you know. Uh, so we are, I would say, uh, our future all. We are in the in the same boat to some extent, you know. Uh, uh, so maybe this is a a, a kind of a, a opportunity for Taiwan to do can do something. For instance, we should uh, uh, encourage country in this region try to you got to dissuade China because we all hurt get hurt, you know. Uh, if China try to launch so-called soft, uh, uh, because all the tension high, all the insurance premiums all all rise up. So, uh, so this is the probably the one opportunity or one uh, uh, you know, we can leverage probably uh, 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 not just to use military means and then maybe maybe we can use this kind of eco economic uh, 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 ties because every country in these regions are tied together. You know. uh, so maybe no, this mm -hmm. is one uh, one way we can deal with and. Uh, and also s send signal to China, and uh, not just Taiwan get hurt, you also get hurt. Okay. So uh, maybe, no, I don't know. Just one way I can single. Yeah. All right, thank you. And Jack? Am I coming through okay? Hello? Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, cool. Uh, I don't think I'm coming through, but. Okay, all right. Uh, so. Um, sorry about that. I think uh, 
the, the type of scenario you laid out, Matt, is exactly um, in some ways, or is very similar to what we've seen in the South China Sea, on the border with India, to some extent in the East China Sea, this type of, and so I think we should go back and re-examine those cases and think about if we kind of knew what we know now with a higher degree of certainty, what should we have done in those early, early stages to prevent it from, from coming along this far? I think this type of economic and, um, and legal you know, means or warfare from China, if you want to use that term in this scenario you laid out, um, would you know, likely be just the beginning. But I think it's also the kind of contingency that we need to plan for multilaterally. Because um, I know you were asking the question about how uh, ready Taiwan is. I think uh, it, it's a, some of that is related to how ready is the United States and our allies and partners around the world to come to Taiwan's aid on economic, legal, and political um, issues as much as on you know a potentially uh, a military contingency. And so I think it would you know it would come to the United States and others to think about what can we do to undermine or block. Uh, or, or break through the blockade, uh, even if it's only partially enforced, uh, and thinking about what are the kind of flavors of blockade we could see from um, administration that's primarily on paper to a more, uh, you know, hopefully not using kinetic, but, but one enforced with Coast Guard and military forces uh, uh, of China, for, uh, vessels coming into Taiwan. And then thinking, too, of, of how can we raise the cost for China uh, and, and China's economy and Chinese shipping um, concurrently with the costs that would be trying to be imposed on Taiwan. Thank you. And i just add my two cents. First of all, regarding the, uh, uh, the blockade or the uh, quarantine, blockade basically is against a port. Uh, and I have to remind uh, everyone here that uh, the uh, in Taiwan Relations Act, the blockade itself has been mentioned uh, as this is the, uh, the concern that the United States has. So it's been written there. And so I just remind everyone that uh, if uh, there's no response or the inadequate response, I'm not going to define whether that's adequate or not, but um, uh, there's a credibility about the United States directly will be affected. And second, regarding the, uh, the quarantine, as you mentioned, uh, quarantine is against a ship. And first of all, in Taiwan, uh, not many ships in Taiwan or they're coming in out of Taiwan, they've carried the flag of Taiwan, Taiwan's national flag. They are international, they are from other countries. So that, which means that if you want to inspect, you actually, you're going to inspect those countries, uh, their, the, the cargoes, and how would that uh, come out? Uh, I mean, this is going to be a major international event. It's not going to just affect Taiwan. Um, <coughs> so that is the, the uh, important uh, the scenario that, that we need to um, look at. Another thing is that um, there are numerous uh, ships because Taiwan Strait and uh, the, uh, the water surrounding Taiwan is uh, one of the major uh, the, the maritime um, uh, yeah, routes. So that the, uh, for the PLA, even though they have a lot of ships, but for them to be able to inspect every single ship there, that is a tremendous amount of resources they need to spend on. And even though if they try to, uh, like uh, I have the 10% the of inspection, it's still a lot. And it's still basically, it's going to be an international event. So this is not just about Taiwan, just so I just second to what the author didn't talk about. But, and also if you look into the details, uh, it involves um, basically an everyone uh, here in these regions. So that then, um, right now I have uh, uh, some questions uh, later. <laughs> some questions from the uh, uh, online audience. Uh, I think they have been uh, waited uh, very patiently. The first question I'll ask both of you uh, is regarding Philippines. Then the, uh, this person, uh, he asked, how does Taiwan view the Philippines given the fact that it's a nearest neighbor and happened to be a U.S. treaty ally? And another uh, question uh, asked that uh, with the U.S.-China competitive framework and the uh, Xi's third term, how should Taiwan uh, prevent itself from becoming the front line or cross fire? I mean, that uh, we can't, but uh, we can definitely can do something uh, to uh, ameliorate or even to deter uh, the Taiwan to become a uh, front line of the, the crossfire. But I think the, the first question regarding Philippines is something that is very important because the, uh, if you look at the uh, Bashi Channel, the northern east, uh, the, the northern, uh, the northeast of the, uh, the Philippine territory is actually two thirds of the Bashi Channel. And uh, its distance from, the, uh, from, from that island, Ami Island, uh, to the uh, uh, Lanyu 
uh, is about uh, less than uh, uh, 100 kilometers. And if you consider the from Kaohsiung port to the uh, Paratus, that is another Taiwan territory, uh, <coughs> that's about 400 kilometers. So that the nearest location of the Philippines' northern territory is actually shorter, just one fourth of the distance from the Kaohsiung to the Paratus, which uh, many of us are very concerned about how the Chinese operation probably will be there. So that's a very interesting question. I'd like both of you to answer this. Well, I guess the, uh, uh, as Yizong said, you know, the, uh, uh, once there's a kind of a, a major uh, conflict in the Taiwan Strait, I would say the whole uh, the ASEAN country, particularly in the maritime southeast of China, inevitably will also uh, get an uh, uh, impact, I would say. Uh, so, uh, um, and also, as Yizong said, you know, the Philippines is so close to, to, uh, uh, to, 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 to Taiwan and the two, you know. So, I really don't know how, what kind of role, uh, how Philippines will respond, but, uh, um, I think the Philippines should also uh, actively uh, 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 play a kind of a positive role. Uh, uh, this way and uh, persuade China got to be uh, uh, careful and uh, got to be prudent, I would say. Uh, because uh, as I said earlier, that all the, the maritime, the Southeast Asian also country will be also get impa impacted negatively once you know, there's a kind of a conflict in the Taiwan trade. So uh, I, I don't know, but anyway, just my initial response. Yeah. Okay, and then Jack? Yeah, so I, I would add, I mean, I think what I've observed over the last couple years is the potential for a Taiwan contingency seems to be escalating, is sort of dawning on a wider group of, of, um, of, of the community in the region that a Taiwan contingency is not just between China, Taiwan, and the U.S. Uh, of course, we've seen this most prominently with Japan, but I think much of the logic that applies for Japan, as you said, uh, proximity, um, uh, being U.S. ally, you know, applies to the Philippines as well. Um, I'm obligated to give a, a plug for my colleagues uh, who did a, a, a senior task force on the U.S.-Philippines alliance. Um, uh, go to the CNAS website to find it because it has some great um, coverage of, of where we are in the U.S.-Philippines alliance, um, and especially as the transition from the Duterte uh, government to the Marcos government. Um, it, and, it's, and it's that alliance, I think, that will be critical here in the ability to do some of that contingency planning, but also, you know, have access uh, agreements and those types of things in, in place, not necessarily to support forces who would be, you know, who might fight in a Taiwan conflict, but especially all those kind of support operations, um, you know, would be key. And so, uh, again, just this notion that um, there's a greater group or, or a wider group of people in the region who are realizing um, probably something that they would have preferred to not think about in the past because it's, it's such a negative thing to think about, but that, you know, that uh, a Taiwan contingency would very quickly become a regional event um, and trying to, to understand the specific implications of that um, for each country. But at a minimum, it would become a regional event um, for the way an integrated global supply chain flows through East Asia right now. Thank you. Uh, just add up that the, um, uh, when we talk about the Philippines, the, uh, uh, one of the uh, um, internal uh, discussion within Taiwan uh, when the Paratus uh, was uh, one of the hotspots uh, of the Chinese exercise before the August, uh, the uh, role of the Philippines is um, considered to be one of the, the key in uh, preventing China escalating or the added up pressure on Taiwan. Uh, not only because of the Philippines' uh, its, uh, positions uh, uh, about the Bashi Channel, but also the, uh, the presence of the Philippines uh, in preventing China from further uh, um, acquiring uh, more strategic and vetted positions uh, in some area, that is also very important. That can, Philippines can actually make China uh, maneuver to be much difficult and make the American maneuver to be much more easier. And then that will assist Taiwan tremendously. Uh, I, will say, I will just recall that in year 2018-19, uh, there are the Chinese state-owned enterprise or the uh, entity connecting with Chinese state-owned enterprises wanting to purchase a certain island 
right of those northern tip, uh, out, uh, the north of the Luzon Island, those small islands. And some of them, they said they want to turn them into the casino resort, but God knows. I mean, why would people would fly into that uh, uh, in the middle of nowhere area to, to do gambling? So definitely there's a military uh, purpose in it. Uh, and I think at that time, fortunately, that the Philippine military just uh, rejected uh, those still, even though it is under Duterte's uh, leadership uh, at that time. But uh, that episode definitely, definitely indicates to us that the China had an eye about those locations and they want to do something about it. And uh, that also means that uh, the importance of the Taiwan-Philippine communication under the U.S. leadership, uh, that is quite important. This is end up the, all the more uh, the issue about how Taiwan, Japan, United States, but also how Taiwan, uh, Philippines, U.S., and probably even with Japan as well. Uh, that sort of the first island uh, chain co uh, corporations that is needed. So, the uh, Nora, uh, you want to ask questions? I've been waiting very patiently here. Okay. Um, thank you. Nora from, from Prospect Foundation. My question goes to uh, Jack. Uh, we've been talking about uh, the um, some, somebody uh, stated as a forced Taiwan Strait crisis, but I think there's a one uh, important character uh, in this uh, so-called crisis is that PLA trying to wipe out the uh, media line in Taiwan Strait. And I think it's important for uh, not only just uh, Taiwan, but also regional uh, allies to, to try to reinstate the status quo before this um, episode. So I'm curious about how do you think that uh, maybe uh, could be the measures that we could uh, neutralize or indirectly uh, disencourage the PLA to continue this kind of operations uh, that trying to wipe out this uh, medium line in town straight. Thank you. So your direct is going to Jacob? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, please. Well, uh, I think that's a that's an absolutely critical question. I wish I had a better answer for it. I mean, I think the part of the challenge is, you know, that the, the median line wasn't something that was necessarily enshrined in international law. It was, it was more, you know, it came from the USRC alliance and uh, is more of a historical norm. Um, and so uh, getting rid of it or China disregarding it, it's, it's hard to use, I think, kind of legal means to reinstate it. Um, I'm not a legal scholar, so maybe there's something I'm missing. But my understanding is that it's hard to use legal means uh, to reinstate it and sort of fight it in that way. And so I think we'll have to do some more uh, creative thinking about operational ways uh, to respond to those types of median line crossings, and not just the crossings, but spending more time on the other side of the median line, uh, especially in provocative ways, um, and and what to do about that, while also balancing that against, like I said, the wear and tear on uh, Taiwan's um, forces and the need to uh, in, in how the types of aircraft you and and uh, and ships you might do interdiction with are gonna be uh, might take away defense investments from a more asymmetric uh, posture, and so I think there's some really tough trade-offs there. Um, and so the erasure of the median line uh, by China is going to be a very difficult thing to to respond to. But I think you're right that it is worth trying to reestablish that norm because it has been so important um, in in. Uh, as a, as a measure supporting peace, uh, cross-strait peace and stability. Thank you. And then uh, Professor Chen Liang Zhi from IDSR, uh, you have the next question. And then followed by Mike Fonte. Yeah, please, uh, here. <coughs> Thank you. Hello, uh, Evans Chen from INDSR in Taipei. Well, I also have a question for uh, Jacob. Yeah, in your question number four, you mentioned that, well, the military crisis might be going with political crisis. So I'm just curious about that. Uh, how did you uh, define a political crisis uh, in either Taipei, Washington, or Beijing? Okay, I'm just thinking that what well, Beijing has kind of strategy to, you know, generate uh, impact to break down the governance or the uh, authorities of Taiwan and uh, the United States, and also for, you know, lots of democracies. And that would be kind of, you know, much more economic uh, strategy to uh, win democracy, to win uh, Taiwan, instead of military approach. So I'm just thinking that, 
you know, uh, how did you define or how did you um, look at the uh, possibility or any potential political crisis in Taiwan or in the United States for Washington? So I'm just thinking that that would be possible for the you know presidential election in 2024 and uh, the presidential election in the uh, the end of 2024 in the U.S. So if you know democracies uh, choose uh, a much uh, tougher uh, hardliner uh, politicians against the Beijing, that would be kind of a political crisis for democracy, and that would be kind of opportunity for uh, Beijing. In the same way, what would be kind of you know political crisis in Beijing? Well, we, we always know that you know the uh, authoritarian uh, leaders might use kind of external issues to transform their uh, do domestic issues. So, it, but you know, Xi Jinping's foundation seems quite solid at this moment, and it's hard to predict any kind of uh, political crisis for him or for the CCP. So, what? This kind of scenario is quite complicated, so I might, you know, uh, let you uh, expand a little bit further on this matter. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Sure. Thank you. Well, so I, th you make a good point. I think that uh, if I understood you correctly, that, or in, and I agree with this, that it's not any type of crisis is not going to be political or military. Most of them have have elements of both. What I was thinking was something akin to. I think what would happen around Speaker Pelosi's visit created a situation that I would describe as a political crisis. And I think if you add to that something like the 2001 EP3 incident between the United States and China, where there's actually a collision of aircraft, uh, chi uh, you know, Chinese pilot is killed, um, you know, U.S. military personnel are taken into custody by China, some combination of those two things happening together would be uh, have a special potential for escalation in my in my view, and I think you know my sense in watching some of what China did in responding to Speaker Pelosi's visit was that they were wanted to act uh, ag um, you know aggressively and and push the line, but they're also conscious that of things, but the potential for things to escalate out of control. Right, and so you know the putting zones into Taiwan's territorial waters, but not actually sailing into them. You know those kinds of distinctions I think are important. Not challenging Speaker Pelosi's flight directly, um, you know, with with military assets. Those were were key steps I think to avoid exactly this type of crisis. Um, uh, you know, I, I think w when I say a political crisis, I want to be clear that it doesn't justify anything Beijing would do as a result of demo you know sovereign democracies having an electoral process and picking whoever they pick, it's their right to do that, right? Um, but I just, as a descriptive word, use the word political in that. And it's also just, I think, a, a fact that China would probably respond in, in many of these uh, cases. Um, and then I, you, you raised another question, if I just take another moment, about does Xi Jinping's strength mean he has less room to maneuver because now he's made all these promises and there's no one else to blame. You know, he's, he's set all of these standards that he now has to meet. Or is it that he's so strong that he is under fewer pressures than, say, a democratic leader or a leader in more of a shared governance system where he actually has more people to answer to and more of a coalition to keep together? Um, I'm not sure we've got it. To me, that kind of suggests two different analytical lines, and I'm not sure we've reconciled them. And I'd be interested in what my colleagues think as well. Okay. Those are <coughs> very important questions as well. That um, Yeah, please, Mike. Mike Fonte. Uh, from DPP mission. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, good, great panel. This is Mike Fonte. I'm the director of the DPP's mission here in Washington. When the events following Pelosi visit erupted, and there were all those put maps of quadrants around Taiwan and missiles and everything else, a lot of the reporting here was saying how everything seemed so normal in Taiwan. People were going out partying and they were going out whatever they were doing. So I guess maybe it's important for you, you're the kind of first tranche to come through to Washington to give a better sense of what it was like in the terms of how the populace in Taiwan is responding, responded to that. Has there been any change in terms of dealing with defense, dealing with uh, the reserve force, dealing with conscription? 
So give a better sense, I think, of what was, what's the dynamic going on underneath what looked to be like a very normal uh, party time in Taiwan. I'm sure it wasn't, but I think it would be important for people here to hear that. Okay, I think first I would like to ask an, an author. Okay, uh, yeah, Mike, uh, you raised quite an uh, interesting question. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, uh, life as usual uh, during when uh, during the so-called uh, military exercise period, you know, uh, period launched the military exercise. But, uh, uh, but I would say underneath the, this kind of life as usual, we have quite a uh, 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 lot of uh, uh, internal uh, uh, debate or discussion. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, sh what were, uh, should we more uh, military, should we more focus on gray zone operation or not? Because I guess you all know that, that, that our former uh, uh, chief of staff, Gen Admiral Lee, he proposed so-called ODC. But apparently, you know, the uh, uh, ODC cannot uh, cope with this kind of a gray zone scenario, right? So, uh, yeah, no doubt, uh, yeah, on the service, you know, life as usual. But uh, uh, we have uh, quite a f uh, uh, more, I would say, uh, internal discussion or internal debate, you know, what should we do? Uh, how should we prepare? And I guess you you heard the, uh, uh, the, the 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 veteran businessman Cao Xinchen. You know he donated uh, uh, how much money? A uh, ten US uh, uh, about uh, one million US dollars. One, one, one hundred million. One hundred uh, million, million US yeah. dollars. And he tried to you know uh, help training so called the, uh, 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 the the militia type. I was a militia type. The the soldiers. You know. To to do the home defense, you know. So this kind, so uh, so uh, yeah. On the service, you know, life as usual. But I would say uh, we do have lots of concern. We do have lots of uh, internal discussion uh, here, there, and uh, different ideas, and uh, among different political parties. Yeah. So <coughs> those are I can uh, share with you. Yeah. yeah. Let me add to that. The um, uh, first of all, uh, the uh, public attitude uh, toward the Italian security has significant changes after the um, invasion of Ukraine by uh, Russia. And uh, one of the uh, uh, things coming out is that uh, not only the people uh, in, in various opinion surveys since then uh, about uh, your will to defend Taiwan, the, the average is over 70 percent, even some of, the, some of them even higher. But also the sense of that uh, Ukraine can do it and th so can we. Uh, because when people compare about the uh, Taiwan versus Ukraine and the China versus uh, Russia, and it seems that uh, Taiwan could enjoy a certain the geographical uh, strategic advantage in terms of the defense for Taiwan. So there's a, a can-do uh, uh, the uh, sentiment among the uh, Taiwanese public. But as the uh, uh, Ukraine uh, situation developed and uh, the, um, the Russia's uh, successful use the nuclear threat to compel uh, the NATO from uh, direct involvement uh, in the Ukraine. People's uh, attitude toward about the U.S. will come to Taiwan's defense, started to decline. And uh, before the, uh, the December, uh, the, uh, last year December, when the opinion survey regarding the Taiwan's uh, public confidence about the U.S. Uh, assist uh, to Taiwan defense, or they come to Taiwan defense, that was about like 60%. Uh, about the level, but uh, and after the Ukraine uh, ish, uh, invasions and especially after uh, April, the uh, that level uh, dropped to uh, fifty per, uh, fifty percent, and I think yeah forty uh, forty some percent 40 close to fifty, and then the uh, uh, another survey conducted after. Uh, I think uh, right in the middle of the August, uh, the Chinese mil military uh, exercises, uh, that uh, number continued to dip. So that is the another uh, interesting development. Uh, so that this uh, uh, issue about how Taiwan, about the United States, and also uh, what we should defend Taiwan, that is there. But um, the, uh, about the confidence regarding Taiwan militaries, uh, are we able to defend uh, the Taiwan on our own? Uh, the uh, populace uh, does not have that kind of confidence about what the military can do. So the, uh, uh, the, the desire that, that we need the United States help to help us so that we can hold on, uh, that is overwhelming. Uh, but uh, the confidence about the United will come to Taiwan's defense, uh, that uh, people's confidence started to drop. Um, <clears throat> and in combination with those, of course, we, right now we have uh, several military reform and some of the uh, action by the civil society 
uh, try to come up with the uh, uh, how to prepare people for the uh, for the war. Uh, for example, one of the uh, the major initiative is a Kuma Academy, which uh, started to uh, uh, receive a major public attentions, uh, and they do the the training courses, they do the the public lectures about how to prepare the war for uh, for the Taiwanese people, what you should do, then the what kind of skill you should have, and some people even talk about how we're able to. Um, uh, uh, separate those skills into different uh, um, skill set so that people through the training courses they can have uh, several certificate and then the register so that the, uh, uh, the, the government will be able to know from each person about what kind of skills that they have and then when the things needed and they will be able to call upon the, the people in the vicinities about what the things that they need to do. So those are, those are all kind of consideration and the, the preparation that uh, from the civil society and in some part of government they are talking about. Uh, but still, I think the hard power is, is important. And also the uh, uh, commitment to Taiwan is another important thing. Because when people talk about, especially from the US, they talk about that uh, the, what is your, your will to defend Taiwan? And the, uh, the it seems it uh, indicates to me that uh, the people to defend Taiwan, the will is there. But uh, how about the, um, uh, uh, for them to continue to the fight, they need to have hope. The hope which means that the U.S. Uh, will come in, come in whether that's uh, later in the two weeks or three weeks or later, but we're not going to fight alone. This is another lesson that uh, people in Taiwan they take from the Ukraine uh, the crisis where the Ukraine are able to uh, resist, not only because of their own people, their heroic behavior, but also the, uh, the assist and the help from and other countries. And that's going to be very important. And that adds up to the another issues about the blockade, because in comparison with the Ukraine, where they, they have a land border with many countries, friendly countries, and Taiwan is an island. So that this Chinese August exercise against Taiwan, that started to, uh, to change some of the, uh, uh, the warning scenario uh, of our planners about how the future war on Taiwan could be. In the past, we have a dichotomy about the direct attack on Taiwan or some other gray zone operations. But now it seems that it will be a continuum uh, from the gray zone, uh, first uh, on the uh, quarantine, and then escalate into the blockade, and then escalate into the full, uh, full invasions. And if that is the case, we cannot afford to let China to occupy advantage positions uh, later on, then, so that we can, uh, all we could do is on the anti-amphibious operations and the defense. And so that adds up to the discussion and the debate within Taiwan with the United States about uh, what uh, the asymmetrical defense could do. Uh, whether the uh, uh, asymmetrical defense focusing on anti-amphibious operation will be adequate for Taiwan to really address the issue about the blockade and the quarantine, in which uh, China probably will be able to uh, and, uh, take a strategic advanced position vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan before they even launch the food, uh, food invasions. And so that, that is the issue about the, the mainline of Taiwan Strait that is important, about to uh, repel the uh, Chinese, the, uh, the maritime incursion, uh, that is important. And because we cannot afford to lose those strategic uh, depths, especially uh, for a small island like Taiwan. So that's just add up some of the context. So any questions from the audience? Susan, you want to ask twice? Uh, but hold on, uh, I, th I think we have another person that uh, you, right? Yeah. yeah, right on the back because the, uh, the he hasn't asked any question yet. Yeah. Um, thank you, Daniel Bonomo, Center for New American Security. Um, Mr. Ding, in your opening remarks, you mentioned that um, Xi Jinping needs to show progress on the Taiwan issue um, in, this, in this next term in order to um, prove his legitimacy. What would you define as progress? And um, especially if we see um, kind of the role that domestic propaganda has played in, in Russia in shaping kind of Russian views on the war versus the actual facts on the ground. How much of that progress needs to be real meaningful progress versus just shaping the, the narrative for the domestic audience? Uh, yeah, uh, this is quite, uh, again, quite challenging question because uh, as I say, you know, uh, uh, I, I have no very concrete idea how to how should be defined, you know. Uh, but for instance, if uh, uh, Taiwan can be for to sit on the negotiation table, for instance, you know, uh, uh, for instance, all the through all kind of a, a psychological operation, and the Taiwan society will get paranoid, and the president, uh, ruling president, uh, whoever, which whichever party, 
and decide. So we should uh, sitting on the table negotiate with China. Maybe you know under that kind of circumstance, then you know uh, Taiwan is quite paranoid for intern. Then China have the you know the, the uh, upper hand. Then that might be a kind of a, a progress. Maybe you know. So uh, uh, so uh, Taiwan had quite the, I would say a, 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 a challenge work to do you know down the road. And so uh, we have to uh, think about all kind of scenario and uh, have. Uh, Different plans and uh, and we need to have means and the tools and the, and the ways. You know. So uh, I would say in general we are you know, quite challenged. Uh, so and also the you know the, the assistant and the work with United States is also quite important uh, uh, in that regard. Uh, yeah. Right. Thank you. And then Susan, yeah, you have your second shot. <laughs> thank you, Ijong. Um, this is just a quick follow-up to the, the comments that you just made. You said that the confidence in Taiwan that the U.S. would support Taiwan has fallen. Is that what I heard you say, that the, the p p opinion polls are showing less confidence yeah. in the U.S.? Can you explain that? Can you sort of unpack that a bit? Why, why do you think that's the case? We're still trying to figure out uh, what exactly is that. But I think the, um, uh, the people look at the, the United States and also NATO uh, when they deal with the, the Ukraine, uh, especially after the Russia the threat to use the nuclear weapons against uh, the, the West, uh, should they have a direct involvement in the Ukraine? That uh, ring people uh, the, uh, the issue about the U.S. continue, as uh, Jacob uh, said, that strategic ambiguities. And right, I think probably you, you're all familiar with the, uh, the debate uh, about strategic ambiguity, especially right after the, the uh, invasion of Ukraine. And people started to wonder that uh, how are we able to, de uh, to, if the ambiguity hasn't really worked out in Ukraine and the result to put an invasion. And for a country like uh, China that uh, have uh, even the uh, uh, stronger uh, desire to uh, conquer Taiwan and uh, probably uh, even more opaque uh, decision uh, structures uh, than the, uh, uh, the, the Russia. Then the, uh, how would the ambiguity actually work? So that the, uh, I think the, the added up about the actions about, or non-action by the United States and the continued discussion about ambiguity, that started to fit into the people's perception of whether the U.S. would really come in. And I think the, another thing uh, right at the, the August exercises is that um, uh, whether you could say this is a Chinese uh, uh, disinformation or not, uh, some people actually point out that uh, uh, when the, uh, the Chinese military exercise against Taiwan started to intensify, and the Reagan, USS Reagan uh, air aircraft battle group actually sailing away rather than near. And although the United States talk about that, that this is the issue about uh, trying to de-escalate, not to raise the tensions uh, unnecessarily, but the, uh, the people in Taiwan, or the, some people, some quarter of people in Taiwan, they feel that uh, we have been left to deal with China alone. And uh, we are, uh, China is uh, uh, doing everything trying to deplete our resources. And uh, we have been left there. So th there, there's also this kind of the, the feeling that, uh, uh, in my view, um, probably whether that's the right interpretation or not, I do not know. But uh, my sense is that, that it also add, in and, uh, add into, uh, fit into the, uh, the kind of sentiment. Any other questions? If not, I'm going to read one from the uh, online uh, audience. Uh, this comes from uh, uh, the person, Ashley. Uh, she asked that uh, how much Xi Jinping continue pressure on Taiwan in his third term, as projected by both Professor Dane and uh, Mr. Stokes, affect the domestic industrial concerns, particularly with regard to the semiconductor industry. I mean, domestic, probably that means Taiwan, right? So that, uh, uh, would you like to uh, answer these questions? Um, say it again, real quick. So, so okay, yeah. So how Xi Jinping how might Xi Jinping continue pressure on Taiwan in the third term? Uh, uh, affect domestic industrial concerns, particularly with regard to the semiconductor industries. But domestic could also mean the United States, because the U.S. also be affected as well. So if you're on Taiwan, uh, on the domestic end, uh, probably Jack of you go on the U.S. domestic concern. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know the uh, uh, you know the the, the, the Taiwan society somewhat is uh, 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 divided. I, we all know that you know 
blue versus green, <laughs> so and so forth. So, uh, uh, you know, the uh, 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 maybe, you know, uh, we don't know that the, the China might launch some kind of a, 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 a action or uh, uh, pressure those uh, in, in, the, in the blue. For instance, you know, uh, uh, the, the China criticized uh, uh, our President Tsai provoked so and so forth, you know, and, uh, and uh, those in Taiwan in, in, in the blue camp, they also echo, you know, Beijing's uh, 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 the views and the voice. So, uh, and um, so with this kind of, they might, uh, I don't know, but, you know, China might uh, increase its frequency of the, the fighter jets, uh, encouraging to uh, our ADIZ more become more frequent than before. And uh, this will create tremendous pressure for our uh, pilots and the, and the sailors, frankly speaking. Um, uh, so maybe you know this kind of increase in frequency also a kind of a, 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 a tactic. Uh, Xi Jinping might launch uh, when, whenever he see need. You know, uh, whenever you know, next time one uh, politician from United States uh, you know come to visit Taiwan, that China may take this kind of uh, excuse. You know, uh, so uh, no, uh, um, the. Uh, so this kind of uh, increased the military uh, uh, pressure uh, and uh, might create a lot of uh, deepen our so-called uh, internal uh, division between blue and the green, frankly speaking. And the blue say, we should communicate with China. But question is, what do you mean communicate? Well, communicate really uh, uh, can, man can help maintain the status quo. And uh, this kind of communication at what kind of cost? So those are the, the question uh, uh, we really need to uh, deeply to 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 to, uh, to discuss. But you know, basically, uh, the we we all heard that the, the voice from the blue camp said that yeah, uh, uh, we should uh, need communicate as you know the I should not this is not criticize uh, Eric Eric Zhu you know the K KMT chairman, but uh, he said he argued that we should communicate with, with counterparts. The question is, communicate for what? For what purpose? At what, at what kind of cost? No. So no, the, the deepening of so-called division is also a kind of approach, you know, so this kind of a frequent uh, 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 frequency uh, uh, meeting approach, uh, jet fighter worship uh, approach to Taiwan's ADIZ, and sometimes you know, fly over the the so-called median line, and so those are all kind of a, uh, a, a kind of approach, you know, uh, the Xi Jinping can adopt. Yeah. Okay, Jeff. Sure. <clears throat> well, I think on the chips question, my sense is that China is still uh, so reliant on foreign trip uh, chips, despite its uh, attempts to uh, achieve self-reliance in that area, that it's. Uh, that it operates as not its preferred method of economic coercion. I mean, I think it was notable that in the post uh, Speaker Pelosi visit response that you know chips wasn't kind of a, p a major piece of that. Um, I think because the imported chips, especially from Taiwan, are critical for a lot of the high tech goals uh, and and just manufacturing capacity that that China has overall. And to the extent that. China opposes uh, U.S., Japan, or others decoupling wholly or partially from China's economy. Keeping that that link, that couple together, um, is something they they want to hold on to. And certainly, in an ideal world, from from Beijing's perspective, if they were able to invade Taiwan, take it over, and take over TSMC, and then actually have the human capital stay there to make uh, you know to to make the high end chips, but to me, that seems very unlikely for a variety of reasons that we can we can get into. Um, and then, of course, I mean, I think the, the the broader issue on chips, at least in the U.S., is how after the passage of the Chips Act, is our the growth of our domestic industry gonna kind of balance out uh, with those of our partners, both in Europe and Japan, who are trying to build up their industries as well, but also with Taiwan and with South Korea, who are 
the dominant market market players there. Um, in terms of what Xi Jinping might do in his uh, in his third term, I, I agree uh, that um, you know additional um, incursions or in and around Taiwan will probably be a key piece of it. Um, my sense is, uh, I mean, to your point, uh, uh, President Lai, is that that China's trying to think more about what is that spectrum between pressure, exercises, and an actual military operation. And one of the ways you make that successful is by making it unclear both to Taiwan and the rest of the world in real time uh, which exactly it is, right? And if, if the more you mm -hmm. close in military activity you have on a consistent basis, it becomes easier to shrug off and say, oh, well, this happens all the time. It's not going to turn into a larger contingency. And I think to the end, mm -hmm. at the same time, what, you know, one of the challenges China would ha has historically had and still had is if they were going to do a full cross-strait invasion, they would need to mass forces, uh, you know, in, in China across the strait in such numbers that we would have some amount of warning ahead of time. Now, they'll still need to do that, but if they become more sophisticated in having large military exercises that require the same massing of forces, it will inevitably be harder to discern whether it's going to turn into a contingency or conflict or not. And I think that's exactly what they're seeking. Thank you. And uh, uh, Evans, uh, one who have another questions, please. Second one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, another question goes for Jacob again. Yeah, still concentrate on political crisis. Well, usually we say a uh, crisis might be going with opportunity. But in Mandarin, we say Wei Ji, Wei is danger and Ji is opportunity. So uh, how did you look at the case of Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan? Is it really a you know, crisis for uh, the Taiwan trade situation? It's really a crisis for U.S. You know, a promise or a assistance to the island. Well, I'm just thinking that you know we know American uh, from the American perspective, there is no still disagreements about her visit to Taiwan. Some argue that it's kind of you know uh, demonstrates U.S. strong support to Taiwan, and some others uh, argues that well actually her visit, you know, raised kind of crisis in the strait. But I'm just wondering uh, if uh, Washington and the Taipei take this chance to look at the situation and to look forward, you know, a further cooperation in the future. If so, that would be kind of, you know, an opportunity for the U.S.-Taiwan cooperation uh, in the strait. So I'm not sure uh, how did you look at, the, you know, Nancy Pelosi's visit. Yeah, so basically crisis is a crisis, but how to make best use of this crisis and turn that into opportunity, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I think, um, I'm trying to think of what the opportunities are in, in it were. I mean, I think one near term was for us trying to understand more about where the PLA is in joint operations um, and how, the, you know, which areas they might be, uh, you know, operating certain forces. So some of those, like, tactical and operational level details are certainly useful. You know, I think in terms of, uh, I think Speaker Pelosi's visit was already reflective of a high level of support in Congress for Taiwan issues. And so uh, my sense is that, at least in Congress and, and in the administration as well, although it manifests in a different way, it's not a lack of support for Taiwan politically in Washington. It's more a debate about what is the best way to support Taiwan and support cross-strait peace and stability in the process, right? And I think overall, the, the school of thought that I would subscribe to is, is really that one that, that understands that, you know, there are symbolic actions that are important, but we've really got a lot of work to do on the substantive side, especially in terms of military deterrence. So if we know there are things like the median line that China is, is going to use, you know, they're, they're going to have a ratchet motion where they escalate, but they're not going to go backwards, we, then by definition, unless we push them back, there is only a certain number of those that they can do. And so we should use our opportunities in a way that puts Taiwan in a better position to defend itself, regardless of whether the U.S. or other allies come to Taiwan's aid. And just on, on the note about public opinion, I mean, I think just watching it as a foreign policy observer in Washington, 
you know, the U.S. record has been that we're much more likely to, uh, looking across the whole spectrum, that, you know, U.S. support goes longer and deeper uh, to those who are helping themselves. I mean, I think a lot of what shaped the politics around support for Ukraine was the, the sense that the Ukrainians were going to fight one way or another. It's just a question of whether they were going to have the equipment they needed to do it well. And I think that was a shot in the arm politically uh, in support of Ukraine here in Washington. And so something of the paradox of, uh, of just kind of getting away from this idea that, you know, we, you know, our fight is contingent on U.S. intervention, just as a political signal, I, I would argue for putting it sort of a different mm -hmm. way, um, because uh, because of the way that kind of politics works here. And I, like, there are so many differences on the Taiwan situation that I, I don't want to make any undue comparison between Ukraine and Taiwan, and there's, there's a lot of undue comparisons one could make. But I think that is an important factor to, un to, to really take home, and the fact that from sitting in Washington's perspective, if you know you see that that uh, uh, the sense of support among people in Taiwan that the U.S. would come to Taiwan's aid results in the type of self-help actions of organizing civil defense, you know, potentially lengthening uh, military service, um, you know, increasing the defense budget. Those things we've been asking Taiwan to do and urging Taiwan to do separately. So I think we just have to be clear about kind of where we are in the politics of that. On some level, you could argue the fact that P Taiwan people were unsure about our, you know, the U.S. intervention in the event of a contingency helped drive them to take actions that will make them better prepared to respond to one. Um, so I think there, there's a lot to sort to, through there, but I, uh, it's, uh, I think it deserves more scrutiny. Thank you. Um, I will say that um, uh, thanks for the response. Uh, I think the, uh, the you just mentioned about one of the important issues here, uh, especially about the Chinese want to push for the new normal. And so the, all the concern by Taiwan is that uh, how to prevent this new normal from realizing itself. Uh, and that would uh, demand the, uh, the closer to the Taiwan-U.S. coordination and cooperations. And uh, I would say that the um, uh, Taiwan's defense, the Taiwanese people's uh, will to defend for themselves is not contingent about uh, about whether the United States will help Taiwan. Uh, but uh, this is uh, the obligation and people realize that. But the issue is that um, um, we are going to uh, organize our own defense. And uh, right now all we hear is that uh, what uh, you should defend for you, what you should do you to better defend yourself. But uh, we never hear, or uh, but that is probably the public, uh, some of the public impression, what is the roles and uh, mission assignment between Taiwan and the United States in those issues? And uh, with no clear um, definition about what the U.S. and Taiwan uh, roles and mission assignment in terms of the, uh, the issue on defending Taiwan, then the, the impression is that we had to defend in all quarters. Our military cannot allow any uncertainties in those quarters uh, about the defense. And so that when we talk about asymmetrical defense, the people, the first impression is that um, uh, asymmetrical, which means that we're going to lose some part of it, lose some part of it, and uh, we'll focus on, um, on other parts or on uh, some of the scenarios such as anti-amphibious operation. And uh, the uh, defense, basically, uh, the, uh, the people on the attack side, they will exploit those weakness uh, and uh, trying to uh, utilize as much as possible. Usually asymmetrical uh, means of the, uh, uh, the operation is on the offense rather than on the defense. And so that this is, this is one of the key debates within the, the Taiwan itself. And uh, since we had to prepare for everything, we had to cover every quarters, and that uh, required certain capabilities. And so that the, uh, uh, when we're talking about symmetrical defense and, and, the, the, all, and, and the resources and organized associated with those, how would that, uh, that would uh, require a certain uh, definition uh, about how the U.S. Taiwan and roads the mission and the division of labor that, that should come in. But uh, it seems that right now the discussion hasn't really reached that. Um, and that will beg uh, for more discussions and uh, um, conversations. So that um, um, uh, without further ado, I'd uh, like to uh, thank Vijo uh, and me. Thanks for our two uh, uh, great uh, panel uh, experts. Uh, it, this is a great panel, and uh, we are looking forward to, to the next round of discussion. Thank you very much.
China overall seeks to carve out a new kind of global sphere of influence and to profoundly shape the 21st century. The Belt and Road is really a key tool by which China is pursuing this vision. It started out initially with a focus on mostly hard infrastructure, things like ports, railways. It has migrated more and more to have a digital focus that includes everything from undersea cables to facial recognition software to smart cities and telecommunications networks, 5G and more. What this technology or these new technologies really do is concentrate a lot of power in the hands of one body. So it essentially enables authoritarian governments to do what they do best, enforce control over their populations. The phrase they like to use is internet sovereignty. And what that means is that a country's sovereignty, like its borders, that's the writ of the state. As it relates to information, they want to have tight control over communications and media. They have been able to keep information away from the Chinese people, as well as control information. And now they can monitor information and punish people who say things not to their liking, and that, of course, has a huge chilling effect uh, across all sorts of civil society. For authoritarian states, the cost of repressing their citizens is going down, but then for countries that maybe are democratic or at least not autocratic, there's much more temptation to move in an autocratic direction, and there's a lot of resources and technology coming from China to make that happen. These nations with authoritarian leanings are going to be made in the Chinese image if they both have the, the technological blueprints and the laws and the policies that govern the use of this technology. While I wouldn't say data is necessarily the new oil, it is a, it's a precious commodity that the Chinese government has realized that they need more of and different kinds of. The Chinese government's actually been maybe surprisingly candid about its vision for the internet. And as its companies become more and more embedded in the uh, information technology ecosystems of developing countries. It has more leverage over them, it moves their systems toward its model. To be clear, I think the United States and its allies and partners have many opportunities to ensure that the kind of dark future that I've been painting does not emerge. But if we fail, the stakes are incredibly high. I think when you look at how the 21st century will play out, despite setbacks, this was a century in which overall freedom and democracy advanced or not. To me, this question of kind of China's high-tech liberalism will really drive that answer.
The People's Bank of China, China's central bank, is developing the digital yuan, the first digital version of a fiat currency from a major economy. The digital yuan will likely strengthen the Chinese Communist Party's domestic digital authoritarianism. As countries look for models to manage central bank money, Beijing's digital yuan will bring about new standards in the global financial system that risk privacy and governance principles. So far, we know that the digital yuan system will have a two-tier structure, with the central bank managing the back end and state banks and private companies facilitating everyday transactions. It will not be blockchain-based. The most groundbreaking and alarming feature of the digital yuan is controllable anonymity, which allows China's central bank to see nearly all real-time transactions. China's central bank wants to harness the market share and technological innovation of private firms and gain direct access to Chinese consumers' financial data. It aims to shape monetary policy, monitor illegal activity, and curb corruption. The Chinese Communist Party will likely leverage the system to surveil Chinese citizens. The digital yuan system would make it easier for the party to cut off financial access of any individual. Pilot tests have been underway since mid-2020. If successful, China may gain an edge over the United States in financial technology innovation. China will make the digital yuan available for wider use during the Beijing Winter Olympics in February 2022. U.S. policymakers must address the digital yuan's potential to further Beijing's coercive power and influence in the global financial system. America must adapt to the evolving payments space, counter the digital yuan's threats to political and economic liberty, and ensure that innovation in financial technology The United States faces a challenge like no other in its history, a strategic competition with a rising China. Technology is at the center of this competition. Leaders who can harness technology for economic, political and military power will have an outsized influence on shaping our world. America needs a national technology strategy to drive innovation, mitigate risk and compete for security and prosperity. But America cannot compete alone. The U.S. approach to technology must involve partnering with like-minded countries. 
America benefits from a network of allies and partners, including the world's top technology and economic leaders, and it must capitalize on this advantage. A technology alliance is the best way for tech-leading democracies to work together on big issues, such as groundbreaking research and development, securing supply chains, and defending technology norms rooted in democratic values. The core group should include the world's tech-leading democracies. These countries should engage on technologies such as artificial intelligence, 5G telecommunications, semiconductors, and energy storage. And they should engage on issues including standard setting, export controls, and investment reviews. To do this well, stakeholders from industry and civil society should have a seat at the table. If tech-leading democracies fail to work together, they're unlikely to win the global competition. At stake is the ability to shape a democratic technological future. Collaborating with partners and allies matters because the countries that adopt new technologies and shape their use will write the future rules of the road. A technology alliance of democratic countries will empower citizens, compete economically, and help states protect their security, all without having to compromise shared values or national sovereignty. Tech-leading democracies need to form an alliance to ensure that the future of innovation is inclusive, prosperous, and secure. China overall seeks to carve out a new kind of global sphere of influence and to profoundly shape the 21st century. The Belt and Road is really a key tool by which China is pursuing this vision. It started out initially with a focus on mostly hard infrastructure, things like ports, railways. It has migrated more and more to have a digital focus that includes everything from undersea cables to facial recognition software to smart cities and telecommunications networks, 5G and more. What this technology or these new technologies really do is concentrate a lot of power in the hands of one body. So it essentially enables authoritarian governments to do what they do best, enforce control over their populations. The phrase they like to use is internet sovereignty. And what that means is that a country's sovereignty, like its borders, that's the writ of the state. As it relates to information, they want to have tight control over communications and media. They have been able to keep information away from the Chinese people, as well as control information. And now they can monitor information and punish people who say things not to their liking. And that, of course, has a huge chilling effect uh, across all sorts of civil society. For authoritarian states, the cost of repressing their citizens is going down. But then for countries that maybe are democratic or at least not autocratic, there's much more temptation to move in an autocratic direction. And there's a lot of resources and technology coming from China to make that happen. These nations with authoritarian leanings are going to be made in the Chinese image if they both have the, the technological blueprints and the laws and the policies that govern the use of this technology. While I wouldn't say data is necessarily the new oil, it is a, it's a precious commodity that the Chinese government has realized that they need more of and different kinds of. The Chinese government's actually been maybe surprisingly candid about its vision for the internet. And as its companies become more and more embedded in the uh, information technology ecosystems of developing countries. It has more leverage over them, it moves their systems toward its model. To be clear, I think the United States and its allies and partners have many opportunities to ensure that the kind of dark future that I've been painting does not emerge. But if we fail, the stakes are incredibly high. I think when you look at how the 21st century will play out, despite setbacks, this was a century in which overall freedom and democracy advanced or not. To me, this question of kind of China's high-tech liberalism will really drive that answer.
The People's Bank of China, China's central bank, is developing the digital yuan, the first digital version of a fiat currency from a major economy. The digital yuan will likely strengthen the Chinese Communist Party's domestic digital authoritarianism. As countries look for models to manage central bank money, Beijing's digital yuan will bring about new standards in the global financial system that risk privacy and governance principles. So far, we know that the digital yuan system will have a two-tier structure, with the central bank managing the back end and state banks and private companies facilitating everyday transactions. It will not be blockchain-based. The most groundbreaking and alarming feature of the digital yuan is controllable anonymity, which allows China's central bank to see nearly all real-time transactions. China's central bank wants to harness the market share and technological innovation of private firms and gain direct access to Chinese consumers' financial data. It aims to shape monetary policy, monitor illegal activity, and curb corruption. The Chinese Communist Party will likely leverage the system to surveil Chinese citizens. The digital yuan system would make it easier for the party to cut off financial access of any individual. Pilot tests have been underway since mid-2020. If successful, China may gain an edge over the United States in financial technology innovation. China will make the digital yuan available for wider use during the Beijing Winter Olympics in February 2022. U.S. policymakers must address the digital yuan's potential to further Beijing's coercive power and influence in the global financial system. America must adapt to the evolving payments space, counter the digital yuan's threats to political and economic liberty, and ensure that innovation in financial technology does not advance China's digital authoritarianism. The United States faces a challenge like no other in its history, a strategic competition with a rising China. Technology is at the center of this competition. Leaders who can harness technology for economic, political and military power will have an outsized influence on shaping our world. America needs a national technology strategy to drive innovation, mitigate risk and compete for security and prosperity. But America cannot compete alone. The U.S. approach to technology must involve partnering with like-minded countries.
America benefits from a network of allies and partners, including the world's top technology and economic leaders, and it must capitalize on this advantage. A technology alliance is the best way for tech-leading democracies to work together on big issues, such as groundbreaking research and development, securing supply chains, and defending technology norms rooted in democratic values. The core group should include the world's tech-leading democracies. These countries should engage on technologies such as artificial intelligence, 5G telecommunications, semiconductors, and energy storage. And they should engage on issues including standard setting, export controls, and investment reviews. To do this well, stakeholders from industry and civil society should have a seat at the table. If tech-leading democracies fail to work together, they're unlikely to win the global competition. At stake is the ability to shape a democratic technological future. Collaborating with partners and allies matters because the countries that adopt new technologies and shape their use will write the future rules of the road. A technology alliance of democratic countries will empower citizens, compete economically, and help states protect their security, all without having to compromise shared values or national sovereignty. Tech-leading democracies need to form an alliance to ensure that the future of innovation is inclusive, prosperous, and secure. China overall seeks to carve out a new kind of global sphere of influence and to profoundly shape the 21st century. The Belt and Road is really a key tool by which China is pursuing this vision. It started out initially with a focus on mostly hard infrastructure, things like ports, railways. It has migrated more and more to have a digital focus that includes everything from undersea cables to facial recognition software to smart cities and telecommunications networks, 5G and more. What this technology or these new technologies really do is concentrate a lot of power in the hands of one body. So it essentially enables authoritarian governments to do what they do best, enforce control over their populations. The phrase they like to use is internet sovereignty. And what that means is that a country's sovereignty, like its borders, that's the writ of the state. As it relates to information, they want to have tight control over communications and media. They have been able to keep information away from the Chinese people, as well as control information. And now they can monitor information and punish people who say things not to their liking. And that, of course, has a huge chilling effect uh, across all sorts of civil society. For authoritarian states, the cost of repressing their citizens is going down. But then for countries that maybe are democratic or at least not autocratic, there's much more temptation to move in an autocratic direction. And there's a lot of resources and technology coming from China to make that happen. These nations with authoritarian leanings are going to be made in the Chinese image if they both have the, the technological blueprints and the laws and the policies that govern the use of this technology. While I wouldn't say data is necessarily the new oil, it is a, it's a precious commodity that the Chinese government has realized that they need more of and different kinds of. The Chinese government's actually been maybe surprisingly candid about its vision for the internet. And as its companies become more and more embedded in the uh, information technology ecosystems of developing countries. It has more leverage over them, it moves their systems toward its model. To be clear, I think the United States and its allies and partners have many opportunities to ensure that the kind of dark future that I've been painting does not emerge. But if we fail, the stakes are incredibly high. I think when you look at how the 21st century will play out, despite setbacks, this was a century in which overall freedom and democracy advanced or not. To me, this question of kind of China's high-tech liberalism will really drive that answer.
The People's Bank of China, China's central bank, is developing the digital yuan, the first digital version of a fiat currency from a major economy. The digital yuan will likely strengthen the Chinese Communist Party's domestic digital authoritarianism. As countries look for models to manage central bank money, Beijing's digital yuan will bring about new standards in the global financial system that risk privacy and governance principles. So far, we know that the digital yuan system will have a two-tier structure, with the central bank managing the back end and state banks and private companies facilitating everyday transactions. It will not be blockchain-based. The most groundbreaking and alarming feature of the digital yuan is controllable anonymity, which allows China's central bank to see nearly all real-time transactions. China's central bank wants to harness the market share and technological innovation of private firms and gain direct access to Chinese consumers' financial data. It aims to shape monetary policy, monitor illegal activity, and curb corruption. The Chinese Communist Party will likely leverage the system to surveil Chinese citizens. The digital yuan system would make it easier for the party to cut off financial access of any individual. Pilot tests have been underway since mid-2020. If successful, China may gain an edge over the United States in financial technology innovation. China will make the digital yuan available for wider use during the Beijing Winter Olympics in February 2022. U.S. policymakers must address the digital yuan's potential to further Beijing's coercive power and influence in the global financial system. America must adapt to the evolving payments space, counter the digital yuan's threats to political and economic liberty, and ensure that innovation in financial technology does not advance China's digital authoritarianism. The United States faces a challenge like no other in its history, a strategic competition with a rising China. Technology is at the center of this competition. Leaders who can harness technology for economic, political and military power will have an outsized influence on shaping our world. America needs a national technology strategy to drive innovation, mitigate risk and compete for security and prosperity. But America cannot compete alone. The U.S. approach to technology must involve partnering with like-minded countries. 
America benefits from a network of allies and partners, including the world's top technology and economic leaders, and it must capitalize on this advantage. A technology alliance is the best way for tech-leading democracies to work together on big issues such as groundbreaking research and development, securing supply chains, and defending technology norms rooted in democratic values. The core group should include the world's tech-leading democracies. These countries should engage on technologies such as artificial intelligence, 5G telecommunications, semiconductors, and energy storage. And they should engage on issues including standard setting, export controls, and investment reviews. To do this well, stakeholders from industry and civil society should have a seat at the table. If tech-leading democracies fail to work together, they're unlikely to win the global competition. At stake is the ability to shape a democratic technological future. Collaborating with partners and allies matters because the countries that adopt new technologies and shape their use will write the future rules of the road. A technology alliance of democratic countries will empower citizens, compete economically, and help states protect their security, all without having to compromise shared values or national sovereignty. Tech-leading democracies need to form an alliance to ensure that the future of innovation is inclusive, prosperous, and secure. China overall seeks to carve out a new kind of global sphere of influence and to profoundly shape the 21st century. The Belt and Road is really a key tool by which China is pursuing this vision. It started out initially with a focus on mostly hard infrastructure, things like ports, railways. It has migrated more and more to have a digital focus that includes everything from undersea cables to facial recognition software to smart cities and telecommunications networks, 5G and more. What this technology or these new technologies really do is concentrate a lot of power in the hands of one body. So it essentially enables authoritarian governments to do what they do best, enforce control over their populations. The phrase they like to use is internet sovereignty. And what that means is that a country's sovereignty, like its borders, that's the writ of the state. As it relates to information, they want to have tight control over communications and media. They have been able to keep information away from the Chinese people, as well as control information. And now they can monitor information and punish people who say things not to their liking. And that, of course, has a huge chilling effect uh, across all sorts of civil society. For authoritarian states, the cost of repressing their citizens is going down. But then for countries that maybe are democratic or at least not autocratic, there's much more temptation to move in an autocratic direction. And there's a lot of resources and technology coming from China to make that happen. These nations with authoritarian leanings are going to be made in the Chinese image if they both have the, the technological blueprints and the laws and the policies that govern the use of this technology. While I wouldn't say data is necessarily the new oil, it is a, it's a precious commodity that the Chinese government has realized that they need more of and different kinds of. The Chinese government's actually been maybe surprisingly candid about its vision for the internet. And as its companies become more and more embedded in the uh, information technology ecosystems of developing countries. It has more leverage over them, it moves their systems toward its model. To be clear, I think the United States and its allies and partners have many opportunities to ensure that the kind of dark future that I've been painting does not emerge. But if we fail, the stakes are incredibly high. I think when you look at how the 21st century will play out, despite setbacks, this was a century in which overall freedom and democracy advanced or not. To me, this question of kind of China's high-tech liberalism will really drive that answer.
The People's Bank of China, China's central bank, is developing the digital yuan, the first digital version of a fiat currency from a major economy. The digital yuan will likely strengthen the Chinese Communist Party's domestic digital authoritarianism. As countries look for models to manage central bank money, Beijing's digital yuan will bring about new standards in the global financial system that risk privacy and governance principles. So far, we know that the digital yuan system will have a two-tier structure, with the central bank managing the back end and state banks and private companies facilitating everyday transactions. It will not be blockchain-based. The most groundbreaking and alarming feature of the digital yuan is controllable anonymity, which allows China's central bank to see nearly all real-time transactions. China's central bank wants to harness the market share and technological innovation of private firms and gain direct access to Chinese consumers' financial data. It aims to shape monetary policy, monitor illegal activity, and curb corruption. The Chinese Communist Party will likely leverage the system to surveil Chinese citizens. The digital yuan system would make it easier for the party to cut off financial access of any individual. Pilot tests have been underway since mid-2020. If successful, China may gain an edge over the United States in financial technology innovation. China will make the digital yuan available for wider use during the Beijing Winter Olympics in February 2022. U.S. policymakers must address the digital yuan's potential to further Beijing's coercive power and influence in the global financial system. America must adapt to the evolving payments space, counter the digital yuan's threats to political and economic liberty, and ensure that innovation in financial technology does not advance China's digital authoritarianism. The United States faces a challenge like no other in its history, a strategic competition with a rising China. Technology is at the center of this competition. Leaders who can harness technology for economic, political and military power will have an outsized influence on shaping our world. America needs a national technology strategy to drive innovation, mitigate risk and compete for security and prosperity. But America cannot compete alone. The U.S. approach to technology must involve partnering with like-minded countries.
America benefits from a network of allies and partners, including the world's top technology and economic leaders, and it must capitalize on this advantage. A technology alliance is the best way for tech-leading democracies to work together on big issues such as groundbreaking research and development, securing supply chains, and defending technology norms rooted in democratic values. The core group should include the world's tech-leading democracies. These countries should engage on technologies such as artificial intelligence, 5G telecommunications, semiconductors, and energy storage. And they should engage on issues including standard setting, export controls, and investment reviews. To do this well, stakeholders from industry and civil society should have a seat at the table. If tech-leading democracies fail to work together, they're unlikely to win the global competition. At stake is the ability to shape a democratic technological future. Collaborating with partners and allies matters because the countries that adopt new technologies and shape their use will write the future rules of the road. A technology alliance of democratic countries will empower citizens, compete economically, and help states protect their security, all without having to compromise shared values or national sovereignty. Tech-leading democracies need to form an alliance to ensure that the future of innovation is inclusive, prosperous, and secure. China overall seeks to carve out a new kind of global sphere of influence and to profoundly shape the 21st century. The Belt and Road is really a key tool by which China is pursuing this vision. It started out initially with a focus on mostly hard infrastructure, things like ports, railways. It has migrated more and more to have a digital focus that includes everything from undersea cables to facial recognition software to smart cities and telecommunications networks, 5G and more. What this technology or these new technologies really do is concentrate a lot of power in the hands of one body. So it essentially enables authoritarian governments to do what they do best, enforce control over their populations. The phrase they like to use is internet sovereignty. And what that means is that a country's sovereignty, like its borders, that's the writ of the state. As it relates to information, they want to have tight control over communications and media. They have been able to keep information away from the Chinese people, as well as control information. And now they can monitor information and punish people who say things not to their liking. And that, of course, has a huge chilling effect uh, across all sorts of civil society. For authoritarian states, the cost of repressing their citizens is going down. But then for countries that maybe are democratic or at least not autocratic, there's much more temptation to move in an autocratic direction. And there's a lot of resources and technology coming from China to make that happen. These nations with authoritarian leanings are going to be made in the Chinese image if they both have the, the technological blueprints and the laws and the policies that govern the use of this technology. While I wouldn't say data is necessarily the new oil, it is a, it's a precious commodity that the Chinese government has realized that they need more of and different kinds of. The Chinese government's actually been maybe surprisingly candid about its vision for the internet. And as its companies become more and more embedded in the uh, information technology ecosystems of developing countries. It has more leverage over them, it moves their systems toward its model. To be clear, I think the United States and its allies and partners have many opportunities to ensure that the kind of dark future that I've been painting does not emerge. But if we fail, the stakes are incredibly high. I think when you look at how the 21st century will play out, despite setbacks, this was a century in which overall freedom and democracy advanced or not. To me, this question of kind of China's high-tech liberalism will really drive that answer.
The People's Bank of China, China's central bank, is developing the digital yuan, the first digital version of a fiat currency from a major economy. The digital yuan will likely strengthen the Chinese Communist Party's domestic digital authoritarianism. As countries look for models to manage central bank money, Beijing's digital yuan will bring about new standards in the global financial system that risk privacy and governance principles. So far, we know that the digital yuan system will have a two-tier structure, with the central bank managing the back end and state banks and private companies facilitating everyday transactions. It will not be blockchain-based. The most groundbreaking and alarming feature of the digital yuan is controllable anonymity, which allows China's central bank to see nearly all real-time transactions. China's central bank wants to harness the market share and technological innovation of private firms and gain direct access to Chinese consumers' financial data. It aims to shape monetary policy, monitor illegal activity, and curb corruption. The Chinese Communist Party will likely leverage the system to surveil Chinese citizens. The digital yuan system would make it easier for the party to cut off financial access of any individual. Pilot tests have been underway since mid-2020. If successful, China may gain an edge over the United States in financial technology innovation. China will make the digital yuan available for wider use during the Beijing Winter Olympics in February 2022. U.S. policymakers must address the digital yuan's potential to further Beijing's coercive power and influence in the global financial system. America must adapt to the evolving payments space, counter the digital yuan's threats to political and economic liberty, and ensure that innovation in financial technology does not advance China's digital authoritarianism. Good afternoon. Uh, whether you're joining us from the CNAS conference room or online, I'd like to welcome you back to our event on Taiwan, cross-strait relations, and an evolving world, uh, which we are hosting in partnership with our colleagues at the Prospect Foundation. Um, as a few people have mentioned already, it's particularly exciting for us at CNAS as it's our first event with an in-person audience in two and a half years. Um, still, I'm even more excited to have with me today two esteemed experts on Indo-Pacific affairs, Dr. Chelsea, Sh Chelsea Sh C. Joe and Matthew P. Goodman. Uh, Dr. Chelsea C. Joe is an associate professor in the Graduate Institute of National Development at National Taiwan University. Her research focuses on state society relations in authoritarian regimes and social policy making in China. This year, she is also a visiting scholar at the Institute of East Asian Studies at UC Berkeley. 
Matthew P. Goodman is Senior Vice President for Economics and holds the Simon Chair in Political Economy at CSIS. Before joining CSIS, he served at the National Security Council and Departments of State and Treasury, as well as in the private sector at Albright Stonebridge Group and Goldman Sachs. So the name of our panel here today is Assessing the New Indo-Pacific Political Economic Order in the Post-Pandemic Era. And by my count, that's three hyphens, which means we have the latitude to talk about pretty much anything we want in this session. Um, so uh, whether they were triggered or just amplified by COVID, and I hope we can get into that question during the discussion, over the past three years, we've seen several interesting political and economic trends emerge in the region. Uh, increased economic and gray zone aggression by China, the momentum of the Quad, stalling and rebranding of the Belt and Road Initiative, major attention to critical supply chains, the list could go on for a long time. Um, but I hope that by the end of our panel, we'll have a slightly better concept of where the regional political economic order is headed uh, as the pandemic recedes and we begin to address its long-term consequences. Um, and I'd like to involve both our in-person and virtual audiences in the conversation. So please, if you have any questions for our panelists, um, there will be an opportunity to ask in the latter half of the session. Um, so feel free to percolate in the meantime. Um, but I'll begin by utilizing the moderator privilege to ask a few questions to start us off. So uh, perhaps something rather broad at the top to, to warm us up. Um, at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, experts often observed that rather than generating new trends, uh, the pandemic was exacerbating or amplifying existing trends in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, looking back, do you think that was the case? Um, and looking forward as COVID recedes, will that continue to be the case? Um, and what will be the most consequential drivers of the new political economic order? So Chelsea, if we could start with you. Okay, uh, thank you, Josh. Uh, this is a really great question. Uh, I think I share the same kind of viewpoint of view that I think the effects of the pandemic uh, can be uh, divided into different stages. Uh, I think, first of all, in the initial stage, uh, because the pandemic was an outbreak uh, in China, uh, in Wuhan, uh, and uh, this really has a, a bad image for China's reputation. It's really detrimental for China's rise and, and, and the persuasion of the China model. So I think in the beginning, uh, it was really uh, bad for China, especially uh, in, in the process of China's efforts in selling out the China model. Uh, we see that the uh, similar uh, it, uh, the, the central local relations is, r is really having some problems. Mm -hmm. The local situation cannot really pass accurate information for the, c for the central government. So this kind of a central local uh, symmetry uh, r relationship is really put into question of the effectiveness of the China model. Uh, so I think in the beginning, uh, it's really a problematic for China to sell its uh, governance. But I think after uh, the, 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 the COVID situation became a uh, pandemic uh, outbreak uh, globally, then I somehow see that there uh, is uh, some kind of change for this kind of situation. Uh, because the Chinese government uh, tried to use every kinds of methods uh, and use its uh, uh, authoritarian ru rule to uh, put into practice the isolation policy and, uh, and also build up those uh, makeshift uh, hospitals, which somehow is, uh, uh, was effective to contain the virus to some extent. And uh, this, uh, uh, and, and also I think at the same time, the Chinese government uh, try to persuade the outside world that uh, uh, the authoritarian model is effective in, 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 in dealing with the public crisis. So I think uh, to some extent, I think in the, in the second stage, um, um, this kind of model uh, can, 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 is, it, it, uh, can be sold to other people. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, and, and also coupled with uh, China's uh, efforts to uh, use uh, uh, I think va vaccine diplomacy in, in, in the Indo-Pacific. So I think at that moment, um, in the second stage, uh, it was, uh, uh, I think China probably gained some uh, international leverage. 
But uh, as you mentioned, that the pandemic uh, gradually resists. Uh, I think currently the zero case scenario in China and also the very strict policy uh, in combating the vir virus, uh, put into, again, put into, uh, put into question of the effectiveness of the authoritarian model. Uh, so I think in, in, in a, in a uh, in, in currently, it's really uh, problematic for China to sell its uh, authoritarian model uh, to the outside world. And I think the competing uh, sort of ideology between the authoritarianism and uh, the democratic model in, in dealing with the public crisis, including the, the, the public health crisis, uh, and uh, also uh, uh, make it uh, important for the different kind of uh, uh, part, uh, different kind of countries within the Indo-Pacific to make alliances. So the the competing ideology, along with uh, uh, the alliances connected to this idea, uh, these two ideology, I think will be the. Uh, the, the driving force for future uh, development and dy dynamics within the Indo-Pacific region. Excellent, thank you. Yeah, I hope to get into some of the things you raised later on in the conversation, but uh, Matt, I'd like to ask you the same question. Um, to what effect do you think the, the pandemic has had on, on the trends that we're seeing in the Indo-Pacific these days? Well, thanks, Josh. It's great to be back with friends at CNS, CNS, CNAS and, and uh, particularly in person. I didn't realize this was the first event uh, that you guys have done, so that's terrific. I um, uh, also commend you on your use of hyphens. They're, I love hyphens, and, and there's a lot in there uh, and a lot to talk about in the Indo-Pacific, So, um, and it's a big question. I mean, look, I think I agree with the basic um, premise that I think was in your question that you know a lot of the um, trends underway in the order uh, were there and the, before the pandemic and, and have been in some cases amplified um, by them. Uh, you know, the, um, the overall strains on the, the order, that is the order that the U.S. kind of created and, and, um, and championed for 70 years was already under strain both because of uh, the challenges from China and, and other large emerging markets. Um, also from within because we were um, increasingly dissatisfied uh, and challenging the order ourselves. Um, uh, and uh, so I think those, those trends were underway. The competition between the U.S. and China was already there. Um, the, um, uh, the, the kind of on the ground forces of, uh, I'd say, um, I can't come up with a fancy word with multiple syllables, so I'll just say deglobalization, but then I'll, I'll, I'll caveat it by saying I, I think, you know, I don't think we're talking about a fundamental um, end of globalization, that's my basic view, but clearly some of the, uh, the forces that had brought together um, our economies um, over the previous you know, 30 years were starting to untangle anyway for a variety of reasons like you know, the cost of doing business in China had risen a lot and so kind of that mo China being at the center of this sort of global production chain had already, was already coming under some question or, or even strain and companies were looking for the next dollar of investment at other markets and so forth. So, um, you know, there were, there were things that were happening anyway, and the pandemic has, has accelerated um, uh, some of those things. And certainly, I think the, uh, the, de the, the decoupling or, or deglobalization uh, trends have been accelerated uh, by the pandemic. Uh, the the U.S.-China competition has been uh, amplified uh, by uh, by the pandemic, um, but um, but I think that uh, and, and our sort of our, our different approaches, as Chelsea said, to responding uh, to the pandemic has also highlighted differences in our in our you know in our governance structures and and maybe highlighted. Uh, I'm not sure I'm exactly in the same place on on how China's uh, overall performance has been and how people are viewing that. Um, I'm a little more. Um, despite all of our fumbling and all the rest of it, I think at the end of the day, our, our ability to develop the vaccines themselves um, and our ability to ultimately um, kind of get back to business, um, two things that China has not really been very successful at, um, I think are, are showing some of the, the advantages of our system as well. So, um, so I, think, uh, I think these things are still very fluid. There's a lot going on. It's hard to sort of summarize in, 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 a, in, in, in one uh, piece, but I do think, um, I do think that uh, 
that the COVID has you know, accelerated trends and has not really helped in a way it could have helped in, um, in perhaps uh, creating some new um, uh, impetus for, uh, you know, for connectivity and for cooperation even to, to address something that's clearly a shared a shared threat. It has not done that, so that's that's discouraging. Lots to lots to think about there. Um, if I could ask a, a follow-up, kind of on that point. So, as you noted, certain aspects of this have have ushered a, an end to certain sorts of global cooperation that, at least on the economic side, that we may have seen in the past. But there appear to be two contradictory trends in the Indo-Pacific. Um, on the one hand, there's a push for more economic integration uh, and liberalization through initiatives like CPTPP and RCEP. Um, on the other hand, there are the moves that, that you're discussing in bolstering economic security, um, s resilience through industrial policy and economic coercion, more notably on, on Beijing's side. Um, but do you view these trends at odds with each other? And if so, do you foresee like, where do you foresee the end results will lie? Back to me again. Yeah. Um, so I, I, think, um, I think you're right. Those things are all happening, and um, they are somewhat at odds with each other. But, uh, you know, look, the, imp the impetus, the, the, um, the sort of the, uh, the, the natural um, forces that are pushing integration are real and still there. I mean, uh, we all... Uh, benefit um, from uh, from greater economic integration, and uh, you know every country wants to have good economic uh, ties with uh, with the United States and with China, um, and uh, and there are interdependencies there, and and um, the policy issues we can talk more about CPTPP and RCEP and so forth. Those sort of ride on the back of that. I don't think of those as the drivers of of integration. They're sort of um, advancing it directing it in a certain way but but the forces are there anyway because there's a there's a obviously sort of um, uh, uh, real benefit to each of us and all of us to to those forces of integration um, but on the other hand yeah there is this greater premium now on um, on security resilience and uh, I do think that the the sort of previous 30 years of where efficiency and you know, cost um, improvement was the sort of main driver of, of economic integration. Uh, you know, that's still there, but I think marginally the balance has shifted a little towards uh, security, resilience, and, um, you know, and that's going to be, uh, that's going to be expensive. I often make that point that, you know, it's, it's going to be less efficient and it's going to be uh, less, uh, less uh, it's going to be more expensive to, uh, to disentangle some of these supply chains, you know, move production around, uh, put more security, you know, sort of uh, protections over uh, what we do, more resilience. That's all going to cost something. And the question to me is sort of have people thought through what the costs and benefits are and how much kind of when you have a risk in the world, like the risk of not being able to get masks or not being able to, um, you know, to get critical um, minerals or, or um, technologies, um, you know, with any risk, you, you buy insurance and you, you pay a price today in order to protect yourself against some, you know, possible risk that, that um, could become real. Um, you know, on your car, your house, your life, you buy insurance. We clearly need to pay a little more insurance uh, in order to feel a little uh, safer against some of these risks and more resilient against risk. But how much of a price are we willing to pay? And uh, I don't think that's been really thought through. And, and um, you know, I, I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's obvious we need more resilience, more security. But we also need, the, the, we, need to, um, we need to take advantage of the, the, uh, you know, the benefits of integration, of efficiency, um, and, and get that balance right. Speaking of, of that insurance and, uh, you know, where, where the line really should be drawn. So, you know, even if the, the pandemic is not over, um, it seems like the worst of it is hopefully behind us from a, a public health perspective. So in the Indo-Pacific context, I'm wondering, um, because the, the pandemic exposed so many of these uh, pain points that, you know, may have been looming under the surface for a long time, but not necessarily felt in any uh, concrete way, um, you know, what, what are the, the big lessons we, we should take away 
uh, in the Indo-Pacific context, um, you know, recognizing that it's impossible to be prepared for every scenario um, and every possible situation. But you know, how how can countries best prepare for the future and 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 avoid becoming complacent? You know, without without a, a, a pressing you know pandemic on our on our shoulders and uh, sort of think about this insurance in, in the in uh, with foresight, Doctor. Uh, well, that's a that's a very difficult question. Yeah. <laughs> um, I well, I personally think that communications and uh, uh, more uh, information sharing is very important here. Uh, but it just depends on how you communicate and whom you communicate to. Uh, I think currently uh, there are some existing uh, framework being created like Quad and or Quad Plus uh, uh, and also IPUF. Uh, I think it is also our uh, our on the way is important uh, to facilitate facilitate some kind of uh, cooperation and talk. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I would, I would sort of divide that in two pieces. There's the kind of the pandemic-related um, risks and, and preparing for that. I mean, clearly it feels like we should be doing a bunch of things a little differently, like we ought to be able to get masks more easily um, uh, than we did and more quickly. We ought to be able to, um, you know, and, and the other um, uh, forms of medical um, you know, interventions, we ought to be able to have better alert systems for these things. We, better, we ought to have a greater cooperation among our everybody from scientists to, to policymakers. I, I think some of that probably will come out of this, uh, the lessons of this. I, though, I, on the other hand, I'm, you know, we still seem to be making some of the same mistakes. And I was in the White House in a previous life um, in, uh, in the time when SARS uh, hit in the, in the early 2000s. And, uh, you know, we convened, I convened, actually, interestingly, uh, strangely, because I didn't know anything about health or pandemics, but I was the guy doing the kind of cross-Asia issues in the Asia office at the NSC, and so there was nobody else to do this. So I convened an interagency meeting and brought the CDC in and various other people, um, and uh, they had never met together. I mean, there was no coordination in the U.S. government among the State Department, uh, the you know CDC, all these different players, and you would have thought that we would have, 20 years later, <laughs> Um, kind of figured out those systems, and maybe there, I'm sure there is a lot of improvement, but it still feels like as a citizen reading the paper that we're still, we're still struggling with some of those coordination issues. Then that's just within Washington, uh, let alone, you know, uh, more broadly. So there, there's a lot to learn. That's the pandemic stuff. I mean, the broader point of your question is, you know, are there, um, uh, you know, are there things we ought to be doing to make ourselves more resilient? And yes, and, and I think, as I say, I do think we need to pay a price and a premium to, uh, to do that. And some of the things that Chelsea mentioned, you know, like the Quad and IPEF and uh, other arrangements uh, with our allies trying to um, uh, strengthen our, our supply chains is, is an important part of that. Um, and uh, again, we can talk more about the details of that, but, but I think we are, we are doing some of the right things. We're also building back better. I mean, I think that the, the, the Biden administration deserves credit for putting its money where its mouth is. It didn't get everything it wanted, but it's done a lot to, uh, you know, to make those domestic investments that create greater resilience and enable us then to go out and make the case for other things like clean energy or, or um, more resilient uh, supply chains or better infrastructure or whatever it is that we're pushing out. Um, so I think, I think those are also part of the, part of the lessons learned and, and uh, important you know, steps that have come out of um, out of this crisis, so uh, so I think we are doing things. It's it's costly. Some of it I'm more concerned about, uh, like you know, uh, just take an extreme example. Does it make sense for the United States to present, produce 100 percent of its masks needed for the next crisis? Probably not. Um, but you know, we need maybe to make some, but we need to be able to get some from Canada and Mexico, some from. Japan or Taiwan or other friends, uh, but not to think that we can provide 100 percent, you know, risk-free uh, resilience against any possible crisis. That's just a metaphor for the the broader challenge of trying to get the balance right between, uh, you know, allowing kind of natural economic forces to happen, and then, uh, but then adding in a layer of of resilience and security on top of that at a certain price.
Yeah, on that front, I, I think I can add something. I think in addition to the international alliances uh, and communications, I think uh, we can look at uh, a previous crises as well. Um, I think, it, for example, in Taiwan, uh, we, we dealt with SARS before. And I think uh, we learned from SARS experiences that uh, building some kind of domestic uh, crisis management is important. So I think in, in addition to like international experiences or division of labor, uh, I think uh, in the, the, the thinking domestically, uh, we need to create uh, some kind of uh, a mechanism to deal with those uh, non-traditional non security issues, which always has uh, security implications. A big part of uh, you know the Washington's foreign policy in the Indo-Pacific uh, over the past couple of years has been the Quad, especially to address some of these you know non-traditional security um, aspects, you know, vaccine distribution, um, maritime domain awareness. Uh, so since its reinvigoration towards the end of the Trump administration um, and the four leader-level summits that have happened in in just over a, a year's time um, during the Biden administration. Um, the Quad has, has certainly undertaken an ambitious agenda, um, and so I'm, I'm curious, uh, Chelsea, if you could tell us a bit about how Taiwan views the Quad. Mm. Yeah, I think definitely Taiwan uh, will welcome these developments. Uh, and we know that Quad is not a formal alliances, military alliances, uh, but it's strengthening its uh, security and defense elements. Uh, and there is also Quad Plus. I uh, I think Taiwan can be part of the uh, Quad Plus. Um, I actually just read the, the the very excellent, fabulous report written by you, <laughs> your team. Uh, and I think uh, one of the uh, major point uh, you make is that uh, keeping the Quad flexible is uh, is a good is a good thing. Uh, and I think Quad Plus can uh, be one of the uh, example to make it flexible and and uh, and. Uh, I think Quad Plus can be like more like single issue focused, uh, as you mentioned, like the vaccine distribution and production uh, was also a successful story of Quad. Uh, and I think if uh, Quad, for example, talk about Quad Plus, like gender issues or trade issues, uh, I, I, th I think as, as far as uh, trade agreements uh, concern, I think when we talk about trade, uh, always the issue we need to think at the same time is uh, domestic labor issues. But I, but I think that uh, because trade and labor is always uh, 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 come together, that fact actually make us to easily enact that other issues, for example, like the gender issue, human rights issues. So I think uh, uh, in addition to emphasizing the economic integration, uh, I think uh, Quad can focus on m more non-traditional uh, economic or security issues, including like public health uh, or, or gender issues, human rights issues. I, I, I think uh, if, uh, if the Quad Plus is more uh, about like one single issue, uh, then uh, Taiwan can probably be part of uh, the, the participation. Yeah, I agree. I, th I think, uh, you know, Matt, like you were saying, um, I think one of the big benefits of the Quad, in addition to the, the focus areas they've selected, is, is that it's building habits of cooperation. Like people are meeting each other, you know, and, and that's something that is much bigger than, than just the individual um, issues that they're working on. Um, and I would be remiss to, to not uh, also acknowledge my co-authors on that report, uh, Jake Stokes, um, Lisa Curtis, and our former U.S. Navy uh, fellow commander, Andrew Adams, um, as well. But uh, Matt, did you want to? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I think the Quad is, is a really um, significant development. Uh, and, you know, the Trump administration um, first, I think, um, had that sort of focus. But, but the Biden administration has really taken it to a new level. And, and I actually think you know, when, and, and I think things have evolved since then, but when they came in, I think the Biden administration saw kind of uh, two existing organizations, the Quad and the G7, as the kind of potential pillars of, of you know, um, cooperation with, you know, with allies and, and important partners. And they built a lot of the other things, like the TTC, the Trade and Technology um, Council with the EU, as kind of, in a way, a way to, to ad advance the G7 conversation, of, uh, because it's largely a European or transatlantic uh, grouping. Um, and the 
problems are not with Japan or Canada, the problems are with Europe uh, for the United States. So, so this was all reinforcing of that effort. And similarly in Asia, I think the Quad was seen as a, as a, as a, a building block for broader cooperation in the region. I, I mean, I personally, I, you guys are, are the real experts on the quad, and I'm a, as I say, I'm a pursuit of happiness guy, not a life and liberty guy. Um, and so, um, so I, um, I see that still as largely a security focused. Uh, the, the power of that grouping is more the, it feels to me like the maritime security stuff is what brought it together, and that's what is really the, the main driver. But there are these interesting other issues they've added to it, and I'm certainly interested in the, um, uh, you know, the stuff on, on infrastructure, the stuff on, um, on uh, uh, critical technologies, um, and, and that work I'm watching to see if something can come of that. I think it's, it's, it's difficult because of, frankly, you know, India's in the group. Um, and so uh, traditionally talking about those, those broader economic issues has been quite challenging. But, but in some cases, I think there, there are aligned interests and and certainly uh, opportunities to advance cooperation. And from there, then there's an opportunity to, you know, as you say, there's Quad Plus, there's, I, I even think I see sort of, you know, dotted line connections from the Quad to, um, uh, you know, to all the bilaterals the U.S. has done with Japan, with Korea, with, with others, and then even to IPEF, which we haven't gotten to yet, but, but I think there is a, uh, there's a consistency of agenda on the economic side um, in a way that, that does uh, show that I think the, there's a deliberate effort by the White House to try to build out um, those, those uh, agenda items. Well, I, I couldn't have teed it up better myself. <laughs> um, understanding that IPEF or the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework uh, is a framework uh, for further negotiations and a lot of it is, is being decided and up in the air. Um, in your view, what, what would a successful IPEF look like um, you know, 13 countries have signed on so far. Uh, they're still deciding which of the four pillars they want to be a part of. Uh, but how do you assess its progress up to this point? Um, you know, given what we ought to expect uh, from from uh, where things stand, um, and the of course the million or perhaps trillion dollar question is, uh, how will IPEF incentivize higher standards without market access? Yeah, well, ask me again in 48 hours because there is a ministerial <laughs> meeting, as, as right. folks know, in LA this week, and um, and and we'll see, you know, more clearly um, what is possible um, from IPEF. I think, you know, I often say there are sort of three things I like about IPEF. One is the 13 countries. I think that's great that they're uh, the, the Biden White House, having originally wanted to have a kind of very high standard for membership. I mean, frankly, kind of lowered the bar to get as many countries in as possible as the initial starting point. And I think that was wise to do that. Um, and it signals, a demand signal for U.S. economic engagement in the region. So that's, I think that's one very good thing about IPEF. And, and so it'll be tested this week as to how much countries actually want to play um, in the different pillars and which countries do which of the four pillars is going to be interesting. We're all watching. Um, secondly, I mean, it is a good agenda. These, if you gave me a blank piece of paper and asked me to write down what I think are the top, you know, 15 um, issues the U.S. ought to be talking to its partners in the Indo-Pacific about in the economic realm, broadly defined, I would have written most of those things down. Um, they're, they're, it's the right agenda, and I think it's what our partners want to talk to us about um, with that one big gaping uh, hole that I'll come back to. Um, and thirdly, uh, you know, I do think it's a potential pathway to something bigger. Um, I do believe, and I'm going to say it again, even though increasingly my optimism is, is being challenged, uh, uh, I do think the United States not only should but will be part of a high standard, comprehensive regional trade agreement that is passed by legislatures just don't ask me when, but I do think we will be part of that because it's, it's a gravitational force. It's in our clear national interest. And, and so if, if, if I'm right about that, then this could be a pathway uh, to that because all of the issues that are in the IPEF agenda are, you know, are ones that would be embedded in a new, uh, a new kind of trade arrangement that the U.S. would want to join. So, so I think, um, I think it's, it's positive. You know, on the other hand, it's got this big hole of, of uh, the U.S. not willing to offer greater, uh, at least tariff cuts. I know that distinction has been challenged that, you know, we are offering other kinds maybe of market access but not tariff cuts. Um, you know, I do think that's a big problem because, because that's really what countries want is they want to sell stuff to us, right? Because uh, we, we consume a lot of stuff. 
Um, and so that's the real leverage we have in all of this. And if we're not willing to offer that, then what I'm looking for this week is also any sign of what the other things are going to be. You know, are we going to offer some significant you know, investments in infrastructure or in clean energy transition or in, in, um, in capacity building more broadly? Um, if, you know, if we do that in a smart way, I think that's, that could be very interesting to, to partners. But, but it's still not market access. And, and that's, you know, we're the biggest economy, biggest consumer economy in the world. And that's what people really want from us economically. Thanks. Um, and Chelsea, I'll have a sort of follow-up question for you in a moment, but I just want to mention again, um, so I have a number of these questions prepared, but if you're in the room with us or online, uh, please do feel free to formulate questions yourself for our panelists, because um, I hope to involve you in the conversation shortly. Um, but uh, Chelsea, so before the Biden administration formally rolled out IPEF, um, Taiwan sought to join. But instead, the United States and Taiwan have announced their own U.S.-Taiwan initiative on the 21st century trade. Um, so I'd love to hear from you what you view as the pros and cons of that setup for the United States, Taiwan, and also the regional economic order as a whole. Yeah, I think I understand the reason why Taiwan is not part of the APF, uh, because the U.S. really wants to have more partners to join the platform, uh, the framework. So if uh, having Taiwan to join the IPF uh, will make uh, other partners to be more uh, hesitate. Uh, so currently, I think uh, trade ne negotiations uh, or economic issues uh, between uh, Taiwan and the US is right now still bilateral. Uh, I think it is undeniable uh, that uh, uh, basically every kind of uh, bilateral uh, trade agreements uh, with the U.S. has some domestic implications within Taiwan. Uh, I think, uh, judging from the past, like I think, 20 years, uh, the opposition party will uh, always uh, uh, somehow uh, oppose it uh, to gain some uh, political leverage. Uh, so, um, so bilateral. Uh, negotiation has some uh, domestic implications, but recently I think uh, the, w w w I think we Taiwanese are more optimistic because uh, even uh, regarding the pork issue, uh, even there were some controversies with, within the legislative yuan uh, w w within the Congress. Uh, but still, uh, according to the referendum results, uh, most Taiwanese people know that uh, the bilateral trade agreements with, with, with or negotiations outcomes with the U.S. is very important. It has security uh, implications. So I, I wouldn't that uh, wouldn't wouldn't that worry uh, about uh, the bilateral uh, negotiation right now than before. Uh, so I think even Taiwan is not included uh, in the more like multilateral negotiation, but still more about like bilateral. I think it's still a good thing. Uh, but, uh, but I also want to say, wanted to say that um, one thing you didn't mention is the Chip 4 Alliance. Mm -hmm. uh, I think for most Taiwanese people, uh, Chip 4 Alliance is very attractive uh, uh, because it's multilateral. And it, it also shows uh, the importance of a Taiwan's industry. Um, so I, I actually, actually wanted to. Uh, know that uh, with the future progress of Chip 4 Alliance. Yeah. This is U.S., <laughs> Taiwan, China, uh, Japan, Japan, and, and uh, Korea. Uh, Korea. Right. Um, I mean, I, um, if, if you're asking me and, and you want <laughs> right. me to try to answer so that, I'll allow it. Uh, first of all, I agree with, with Chelsea's analysis about you know, the Taiwan dynamic in IPEF and, and the possibilities for this other unpronounceable initiative, or at least has, it doesn't lend itself to an acronym. Uh, maybe to hyphens if we if we're creative, but the Taiwan <laughs> trade thing um, is is uh, you know it's it's a good agenda and it's and it's promising. It's not a it's not a bilateral trade agreement, um, and um, you know if if someone tells you it is, they you need to understand it is not going to be that, um, and uh, and that's disappointing to some people who think we ought to be doing that. I mean we control that and we could do that. And there are a lot of people in Congress who would like us to do that. It wouldn't be an easy negotiation because we have some differences, but I do think that's something that that um, that, that is worth considering. Uh, but it's clearly not going to be considered by this administration in this initiative now. Um, uh, um, you know, on the chips, for I mean, obviously the semiconductors 
are um, you know, the building block of the, of the, the new economy and uh, they're absolutely critical and Taiwan produces a lot of them, especially the higher end uh, ones and, and uh, I think is a critical partner um, for the US um, and as are Japan and Korea in, in, in their own uh, capabilities in this space. So I think getting that group of countries together, I, I personally think there's some other countries that maybe ought to be part of this conversation, like the Netherlands, uh, for example, which makes a lot of the critical um, you know, machinery and technology to produce the chips. Um, uh, and, uh, but, but it's a good start, and I think there's a lot to work out among just those four, uh, four economies. And so, um, so I think it's, it's an important conversation. I mean, to me, the, it does raise, though, some questions about um, you know, how we're going to uh, how we're going to divvy up different roles and responsibilities for uh, creating a more resilient set of supply chains and economies more broadly. Uh, because, you know, does Taiwan want to give up some of that 90% share in high end um, uh, manufacturing uh, to Korea, just to take the, 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 the nemesis <laughs> from Taiwan's point of view in this space, um, you know, or to the United States for that matter? Um, I don't know. I mean, if, if that's going to be that's going to be a challenging issue to decide, you know, who's going to do what and and where. Um, and uh, but the U.S. clearly, I mean, it just seems to me whatever else is going on, I don't think it's wise for us to be dependent on one place um, for 90 percent of anything so critical. Um, and so that suggests, from a U.S. point of view, we're going to want to disperse that. But you know, that's going to be a difficult conversation with Taiwan. So, uh, so I think it's, it validates the importance of getting these countries together, but it also shows that it's going to be very difficult to, um, you know, to, to work this out, and it's going to be at a cost. Absolutely. Yeah, it's more, more of the insurance from the, the earlier conversation, to, yeah. be, to be sure. So uh, I guess to, to follow up on that thread, um, so both China and Taiwan have expressed interest in joining the CPTPP. Uh, of course, this is as much a diplomatic and political question as it is an economic one. Um, but how do you expect CPTPP members will handle the issue? Um, and what, if anything, should Washington or can Washington uh, do, understanding that you know, we're not a party to CPTPP and that certainly limits our influence in the, in the area? Yeah. Well, this is a hard <laughs> conversation. I've written about this as a Greek tragedy um, because the U.S. inflicted a self-inflicted wound um, by, by pulling out of these arrangements, and then it's being rubbed in our face <laughs> when, uh, you know, when, when China applies um, uh, to join, and you know, it's just there's nothing we can do about it, really. I mean, except make IPEF as successful as possible, get back on that path to, as I said, that, you know, again, I choose my words carefully, a high standard comprehensive regional trade agreement. Um, we need to get back to that. And if, and, and, uh, but I think, I, think, I think we've missed a huge opportunity and created a huge problem for our partners um, who do have to decide what to do here. And, um, you know, it's clear that Taiwan would be a, a more um, credible member of the group sooner. <laughs> um, difficult negotiations there, but, but in substance, Taiwan's closer to the CPTPP uh, uh, standards and, and model of, of um, trade um, rulemaking and, and, and norm, norms. Uh, so other things being equal, Taiwan ought to be, you know, brought in soon. But that's obviously very challenging for all the partners, and particularly for some of them. I think Japan and Australia might be willing to take that bet, but I think the others would be, would be really resistant. Uh, and so then it comes back to mainland China, and uh, you know, they're not ready. They're not worthy uh, based on you know, what the CPTC standards are. Uh, I don't think they're serious. I mean, I think there's an argument that they were serious about using TPP as a as a, as a driver of, of reform um, in, in early Xi Jinping uh, days, but that's long since gone. And I, I think this is, you know, I'm in the camp that believes that China's application is largely, you know, strategic mischief. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I mean, there are people in China who, who get it, but I, I think that's not the reason they applied. <laughs> um, and so that puts the, the existing members in a real, uh, real dilemma. 
I think for now they'll hold out and delay and stall, but at some point they're going to have to take the Chinese application seriously. And, um, and not a damn thing we can do about it. So I've noticed a, a two-finger intervention from our audience. So if we could get the microphone to President Lai up here. Yeah, thank you. A great panel. <coughs> Just several questions. Uh, first of all, uh, of course, our panelists talk about the uh, the the, uh, the issue about deglobalizations, and I think that uh, before the uh, the pandemic hit, uh, deglobalization sort of did uh, coming in the. Um, uh, technology driven the shorten our supply chain uh, rather than the so called deglobalization, but there's a trend about that. And then the pandemic come in, the, uh, the issue about the supply chain security, first of all, safety and then security and resilience become the central focus. Um, but uh, interestingly enough, that uh, since China is so important in terms of the global, uh, global productions, so that uh, the, uh, uh, the current uh, context regarding deglobalization, how much of that is actually about the uh, not the Chinaization, but the less China. Uh, that that when we talk about those issues. So uh, this is the, the, the issue I'd like to ask about the comments. And also, uh, China in the year 2020, they uh, adopted very different economic uh, development strategies. Uh, the so-called the, uh, the uh, domestic uh, circle as a primary driver for economic development out of the so-called twin circle of economic development, which is it's a complete reverse of what they have in 1995 to 2010, in which they uh, want to utilize a uh, the uh, globalization as the economic uh, development model. Now they're uh, in the complete reverse. Uh, so how would, how would you like to comment on this China driven by itself about the trying to decouple from the, uh, uh, from the world? How that's affected uh, the so-called uh, economic order that we have here? Now the third question that I have is that uh, associated with China as well, that uh, China's respond uh, for China to respond to the uh, regional group in such as Quad and others. Uh, recently, China also started to uh, have uh, uh, refocus about the uh, Shanghai Cooperation uh, organizations, as well as the BRICS, as probably uh, uh, some of the, the primary uh, international organization they want to uh, to utilize uh, for their both economic and political uh, influence in the whole world. How would this? Uh, those developments started to also affect uh, when we talk about the new uh, Indo-Pacific regional economic, political economic order, uh, especially uh, the impact from those organizations and Chinese initiative. Now the fourth thing is that uh, uh, the issue about the IPF. Uh, I would say that the when the IPF uh, first came out, uh, of course Taiwan uh, it was uh, a, 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 earlier a, a little bit disappointed about uh, not being included in the uh, uh, IPF discussions. But also we also talked with uh, other friends uh, in this region. It seems that Japan was, wasn't as concerned about the development of IPAP because precisely uh, what they, uh, according to some of them, they told us that um, uh, the uh, IPAP uh, uh, economically, the, uh, the substance wasn't as uh, proliferate as it intended to be uh, in, in, uh, in comparison with other trade agreements. And so that uh, the, uh, uh, in terms of the CPTPP and IPAP, uh, Japan does not think that the uh, IPAP is in the lead to, c in, uh, to compete against CPTPP. Of course, in another way, you could also say that Japan is uh, satisfying with a kind of a complementary role that the IPAP is able to play with the CPTPP. But then, Matthew, you talk about that uh, this IPAP could be uh, the leading to uh, the new trade agreements. And how would that affect the, uh, the its relationship with CPTPP? So I'd just like to ask your opinion about those. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, there's, there's a lot there. Um, I agree with a lot of the sort of analysis and premise of, of your questions. Um, on the, on the deglobalization, again, that isn't the right word in my mind. It's sort of an, an un, a, 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 a gradual unglobalization of, or, or change in globalization. Um, I, I didn't say it, but I would endorse what you said, that I think there were these forces of shortening supply chains um, that were there before the pandemic. Um, and that the pandemic uh, reinforced. But interestingly, I, I think that, you know, from a U.S. business, I, I think, and, and, sorry, I should say that the, from a policy perspective, definitely there are strong, you know, in Washington impulses to try to, you know, I'm getting to your second question, sort of de-signify or pull out, you know, our connection, connectivity with China. But putting these two things together, 
I think the perspective of uh, the U.S. business community is a little bit different from, from policymakers. I think there were those uh, kind of cost factors that were causing them to, to revisit the, the China model. Um, they were also kind of maybe shifting from the model of, of, of using China as a production platform to sell to the rest of the world and sh a lot of companies shifting to, you know, using uh, their base there to sell to, into the Chinese market. So there were changes happening um, before. Uh, there are all these shocks of you know, protectionism and, and uh, pandemics and various things. But interestingly, I don't think it fundamentally changed the view of a lot of, if you, if you actually look at the data, there wasn't a lot of evidence that, that American companies were pulling a lot of investment out of China or fundamentally changing um, their, their, um, you know, their strategy uh, in, the con in, in, uh, um, in the country until uh, this spring. Um, and I think the thing that really shocked a lot of businesses was the, shock, was the Shanghai lock lockdown. I think that had an effect that neither you know, Trump's tariffs nor, uh, nor rising costs in China nor um, controls in China nor the pandemic or you know, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the implications for, for Asia. Uh, I don't think any of that moved the needle that much for most CEOs, but boy, the Shanghai lockdown did. I think that really spooked a lot of CEOs who thought, wow, we thought at least that you know, Shanghai as this hub of both domestic and international um, commerce and finance for, for China was going to be still you know, open for business, but I think that really created some change in, in calculation, and you know, it's cumulative maybe on top of other uh, on top of other other forces, but um, but I think that was really uh, significant. Um, institutions, and I mean, maybe I should pause and let Chelsea come in on that, and then I'll come back to the institutions and IPEF. Uh, well, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, yes, I agree that uh, the Shanghai lockdown really has a huge impact. Uh, but I I, I think uh, also if we, we if we think about Taiwanese industry versus the government, I think they also have different kinds of viewpoints. Uh, I think currently, the, from my memory, the investment, the Taiwanese investment in China has already dropped, but the trade uh, relationship is still there. And I think even within this year, the trade still increases a significant uh, amount of uh, the percent. So uh, the trade interdependence between the two uh, is actually still very strong. Uh, so I, I think that also respect the, uh, reflect the fact that uh, some kind of trade negotiations or trade agreements is very important. Uh, but, uh, well, I think after the U.S. withdrawal from the TPP, is the credibility of the U.S. in uh, building that kind of thing is kind of shaky. But, uh, but I'm, I'm glad to hear that uh, something is going to be put into the le legislation. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, 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 I, so, I guess my viewpoint is that um, for Taiwanese industries, and uh, uh, because RCEP is there, and uh, the Japanese industry and and South Korean industry can have basically zero tariff to invest in China, uh, but Taiwan because we don't have that kind of thing uh, with China, so. Uh, the competition uh, between Japanese industry c companies and Taiwanese industry uh, com Taiwanese companies in, in China is, uh, is actually not that fair. So it's also a concern for the uh, for the Taiwanese industry as well. I think. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Do you, you want to take on the other two questions? Yep. So on the institutional question, um, I guess I step back and look at the broader global order first. When I think about these issues, because you know, if you start with the Bretton Woods institutions, basically, you know, the the IMF, the World Bank, the WTO as the pillars of the global um, uh, economic order, um, I think China's approach to the three is each a little bit different. They've been pretty compliant, pretty um, uh, uh, good citizens, and 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 themselves, I think, accept the, the 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 role of the IMF and have been have been. Um, I mean, these are oversimplifications, but I think in general, the IMF has so far been seen as an institution that China recognizes is important, that it can play a role in, um, and that it's useful to have this, this fund um, uh, there globally. Of course, they want more share and more voice 
Uh, they've gotten some of that, not enough, and they want more. But I think that that is one thing. The World Bank, I think also, I don't think they fundamentally challenge the notion of, of a global institution like the World Bank doing uh, development lending. And China, as it's developed more resources of its own and, and wants to, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, share its its model of development and its you know, use the uh, the tools of of, um, of economic statecraft that come with this. You know, I see the World Bank maybe as a useful part of this if they get more voice. Uh, but they also want to create their own you know parallel institutions, and that's why the Belt and Road Initiative. That's why AIIB, which is a, a different thing, and maybe especially AIIB, is is seen maybe as an attempt for China to to try and lead its own effort. But, but if you look at the AIB in substance, it's largely been you know, doing things with the other multilateral development banks according to the kind of rules and norms and standards that, that have been long accepted, largely. There's a big problem around debt and transparency, but uh, um, which we can talk more about. It's a big topic. <laughs> uh, but I think, I think there's an effort there to not undermine the World Bank, but make sort of a parallel effort to, to lead in, the, in this development space. And then on trade, I mean, that's the one that's maybe most challenging. We're, we've all uh, challenged the WTO in our own ways. Um, but I think China's, by its own just nature, is not um, or the nature of its system and, and the, the, you know, sort of the massive subsidization and industrial policies, and by the way, um, self shameless self-advertising. You know, we did this study of, of um, Chinese industrial policy to try to measure it and, you know, um, in our project called Red Inc. a few months ago, and that, you know, came up with, you know, validation that China's doing a lot more uh, industrial policy than, than, than other uh, countries. Um, and you know that's just inconsistent in a way fundamentally with the WTO system, which wasn't set up to deal with that kind of massive you know um, subsidization and, and industrial policy. It was set up, you know, if I give you a dollar and I don't give Chelsea a dollar, then Chelsea can sue me for favoring you over her. That's basically what the WTO was was set up to do, um, and this is a, just on a different scale. So apart from questions about the governance, that's just a fundamental problem um, in the trade space. So, so I think all of those things are being played out to some extent in the region, um, but, but it, to me it's a more global story. I don't know if that answered your question exactly. Um, then on, on um, IPEF Japan, TPP, I mean, I, I think Japan, my impression is that Japan was desperate to have the U.S. <laughs> engaged in a constructive, you know, form of economic engagement in the region and with as many countries as possible. Um, so Japan was, you know, advocating, you know, for an IPEF that was sort of open and, you know, had as many people in as possible. Um, I, I, I think, you know, they'd like to have, I mean, they say, they still say in every talking point, I think, when they meet with U.S. officials that they want the U.S. back in TPP or CPTPP or to join CPTPP. Um, uh, I think that's really their genuine desire, but I, I actually, again, I'm not sure that's the, what's going to happen. I think, I think it's more likely that the U.S. bridges from the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement, which was passed with a bipartisan support just a couple years ago, um, to then extend that, maybe dock on the U.S.-Japan non-binding agreement, but there is a trade agreement and you know sort of build out from there i think that's probably the pathway back and i think japan would ultimately be supportive of that and and um and that it would be uh consistent with their you know their objectives if not the first best most efficient way to get the u.s back interesting jake over to you thanks for the question uh jake stokes cnas I wonder if I could ask a couple questions. One, you kind of touched on it, Matt, about um, about the kind of evolving debt situation, especially related to development finance from China, but also kind of the questions of resolving countries like um, Sri Lanka or Pakistan who need debt restructuring and kind of China's role in it, but especially in relation to uh, Paris Club financing or, or, or market uh, financing. And then sort of as a, as a second question is, I know in uh, as we potentially are 
looking at challenges in the global market in 2008, or you know, give or take, the role of U.S.-China macroeconomic cooperation in kind of dealing with financial crises are, uh, to the extent that that those kinds of channels aren't uh, working the same way anymore. What are we sort of losing um, if we don't have that? Those kind of channels functioning, and can we get it uh, in another way through the G7, G20, or or some other framework? Um, well, this this debt question is a big one, and there are other people in town who have been tracking it more closely um, than I, but. I mean, in a, in a word, the, the, first of all, there is concern that there are a lot of countries under stress right now. Sri Lanka is kind of in the you know, front pages, but there are a lot of other countries in, in the world that are uh, facing a, a combination of you know, pre-existing debt challenges, you know, now slower growth, pandemic disruptions, climate disruptions, food disruptions um, that are creating you know, additional um, uh, debt stress and economic stress more broadly. And um, you know, I think there is a there is a global sort of um, interest in ensuring that we uh, you know address and contain those those problems. And I think that's a shared interest of the U.S., the rest of the G7, and China, or the G20, if you want to sort of think of a grouping that that includes all of those people and, and then some. Uh, and the G20 has indeed, you know, taken this on on some level because they established a, a, a sort of debt service suspension initiative that's now expired. But to, to let some of these countries, you know, um, uh, not pay their debt debt uh, interest payments for a while, um, and then they created this common framework, which is meant to be a sort of an echo of the Paris Club, where you know countries would get together and 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 you know agree on a. Uh, on, a, on an, a common approach, because the problem is if you, but China prefers not to do that for several reasons. I mean, they, they don't want their, their arrangements to be too transparent. They don't want to do something that has a Western name like the Paris Club by itself is maybe back to this institutional question, you know, just by itself, that's awkward. And then they, they prefer to deal bilaterally. Um, but the problem is if you, you know, if anybody does any kind of special deals and other people could get, um, could get uh, disadvantaged and so there's a clearly a common interest in coming together but these issues I, I would like to think that the, the G20 would be actively talking about these things and in Indonesia in November that we'd see some more tangible progress at that level but um, I'm not optimistic because you know the G20 has Russia in it too and um, you know nobody wants to do anything half the room doesn't want to do anything with Russia in the room and the other half of the group won't do anything without Russia in the room. So I don't know how they're going to get anything done. But anyway, there's a lot behind that. Now I've forgotten your second, your second question. About US-China cooperation. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, yeah, it's, it's really a problem that we don't have these channels um, between the US and China. Um, and, uh, you know, we need to find a way to, to recreate that. Um, uh, and I'm sorry, because I, I maybe missed the key part of your question about whether the direct U.S.-China, because you've introduced the G7 and stuff at the end, but... Um, Can it be replaced with some other uh, body or function? Yeah. I mean, I think... Um, no, I think there's no substitute for the U.S. and China to be talking to each other uh, directly, and I think at a very senior level. I, I don't think we need a strategic and economic dialogue with or without ampersands or hyphens. Um, uh, but we do need, I think, a high-level um, uh, channel. I mean, I've written about this and, and think that the, the channel that brings together, you know, the top economic and sort of foreign policy leaders, so at the moment, you know, Liu He and, and Yang Jiechi in China, and on our side, probably be three people now, unfortunately, on our side. Uh, but you know, Jake Sullivan as National Security Advisor, um, Brian Deese as the National Economic Director, and, and Kurt Campbell, because we have that role now. I mean, I think a grouping like that should be meeting regularly. Maybe they are, um, but there's a lot to talk about, and, and um, you know, both managing our differences and, and trying to find that you know, white space where we might be able to actually address things like pandemics or debt or, you know, or, or other problems that we, we share concerns about. And I don't think there's any, there are other things that we ought to be doing, but I don't think there's any substitute for reconnecting in some way. And I'm not optimistic that that's happening.
are going to happen. Should we take another room question? Uh, before we take the question, I just want to note again to our online audience, uh, we're ha happy to take your questions as well. So shoot them our way, please. Thank you. Uh, Susan Lawrence, Congressional Research Service. Thank you for the great discussion. Um, two Taiwan-specific questions um, for both of you, if, if I could. Um, one is about the, you mentioned, Matt, very briefly, this idea of a free trade agreement with Taiwan and that the current um, dialogue we've got going is not that. Um, just wondering for your thoughts on what the feasibility of a free trade agreement with Taiwan would be, given the sort of very special circumstances of, of Taiwan status, you know, the, the TECRO AIT model for <laughs> agreements, how does that work um, for a free trade agreement? Um, what, what are your thoughts? You know, is it something that you would support, you would think should be done? Um, and then secondarily, Taiwan, big issue for Taiwan is this double taxation issue that they've got with the US, and I wonder if you've just got thoughts on that and kind of what a path forward for that on that might be. Thank you. Um, oh gosh, I'd like Chelsea's view on, on, on th this. Please go ahead and then I'll, I'll Yeah, Yeah, um, I, I, I like uh, the, the common uh, argument is that the trade agreements can only be signed by two countries, uh, but I guess uh, you can be creative uh, and it's it's the responsibility of uh, probably the U.S. to be more <laughs> creative. Um, and uh, I think Taiwan is, uh, should, uh, judging from the current uh, referendum results, we are uh, determined to have the, this kind of uh, trade agreements uh, and, uh, and, and deeper uh, real economic relationships with, with the U.S. Um, so if, uh, if it's not a formal, tra formal trade agreements, uh, it can be somehow uh, like some uh, kind of uh, other kind of uh, written things, um, but just to be more creative and, and uh, can be flexible uh, as well. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, I, I again, I'm, 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 uh, I'm an economist and looking at the sort of economic arguments for these things, I don't know enough about, you know, either the kind of the the le legislative kind of and legal um, challenges and questions, uh, nor about the you know the the sort of the the, the, the Taiwan related you know sensitivities. I mean the sort of political and diplomatic and uh, sensitivities. But on the merits, I mean the the argument against doing a bilateral trade agreement always was that Taiwan wasn't really ready to do the things necessary to you know to achieve a, a meaningful agreement. And you know, if you boil it down to one word, it was rectopamine as the kind of metaphor for that problem or real problem. Uh, that's you know now been addressed, and it seems that you know Taiwan's serious about doing this and ready to do it. And I'm sort of ready to believe them that it's, 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 it's possible now to do a substantive agreement. Again, that would be a difficult negotiation. We have some differences, um, but all trade negotiations are difficult. Um, exactly what form it takes and how it passes those other tests, I, I don't know. But I, I am, as an economist looking at, and to sort of, I, I, I don't hide behind being an economist. I would say being a, you know, being a US economic strategy um, focused person, I think this would be a good idea. Yeah, I would, I would, you know, I think it's worth pursuing or, or exploring at least. And if it, if it can't work for those other reasons, yeah, that's one thing. But, but if it, but on the merits, it, it seems to me a, a useful thing and something that we're both ready to, to talk about. And, you know, there'd be a lot of congressional support for it. I um, mean, you can tell me because you talk to those guys more than I do. But, but just from reading the papers again, it seems like there's been, or reading letters that have been written, there are a lot of con Congress people who, who would support something like that, whatever its exact legal form. Um, on the taxing, I haven't, I won't bluff you, I haven't looked into that in a long time, but I was a Treasury official once upon a time who uh, tried to fend off those questions in the Japan context because the U.S. and Japan also had a double taxation problem, and uh, years ago, and finally resolved it. But it was it was very difficult, and uh, and it's a charge thing. But I don't think, again, I don't know the details of that situation. But but I don't think Taiwan should take it personally. That, that those are those are really uh, difficult issues for our, you know, for our uh, tax authorities, and um, you know, so. 
I, uh, I think, you know, it's, it's probably in principle a good thing, but it's in practice very hard to work through that. Jake, please, anyone, first questions? Oh yeah, go for it. Hi, uh, Neil Thomas from Eurasia Group. I just uh, wondering if the panelists have any thoughts on whether the possibility of a Republican taking the White House in 2024 would have any effect on your assessment of the prospects for US cooperation with Indo-Pacific allies and partners, including with relation to Taiwan, but also the other you know, economic and security agreements you are discussing. Uh, is it, am I getting, going to get in trouble by saying it depends which Republican? Um, <laughs> um, um, because I think, you know, analytically, I think it does matter if it's Donald Trump, that's one thing. If it's anybody else, um, I might have a slightly different answer. Um, because I think, you know, first of all, I shouldn't, I'm not a political analyst and I don't know what's going to happen, you know, um, in politics today, let alone, you know, a couple years from now. Um, so you need to ask someone else, but but if it's a hypothetical, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot that the Republican Party as a party shares with, you know, with the current administration in terms of approach and some of the things as we've even touched on that, you know, predated this administration, the Trump administration was, was working on. But um, uh, so I, I don't think there'd be a lot of daylight in terms of the importance of the Indo-Pacific, having a sort of a strategic approach to the region, you know, trying to work with well, here's where you know maybe differences of approach in terms of you know what kind of relationship we'd have with our allies, um, you know what uh, what kind of tools we'd use vis-a-vis -vis China, um, but uh, you know and again if it's uh, again I think it's a mixed story on something like TPP or or something like that. You know there are Republicans. Uh, in fact, I think if the Republicans take over the House in in this November. Uh, I think I've heard from people up there, and maybe Susan has more insight into this, but that that would, um, you know, would on the like on the Ways and Means Committee, uh, if it's run by Republicans, there are members there who would actually be a little more interested in in you know a serious trade uh, policy out in that region, um, and you know whether politics will allow them to actually work with the Biden administration is another question, but I think in substance there's a, there's a lot there. That would be um, uh, would be consistent with with uh, you know previous approaches by series of administrations. So, but you know, yeah. I mean, I think it could be very different. <laughs> it could be. Want to weigh in in that one or? Oh, oh okay. Uh, it's well, that way. I, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. But I, I, I think uh, to some extent, I think right now the support, uh, congressional support for Taiwan is kind of uh, bipartisan. Uh, so I wouldn't worry that uh, too much. Uh, and also I think, um, well, well, I'm a comparative uh, a politics person. Uh, I usually look into the domestic policy. But in terms of uh, the US-China relations, I think it's still more about the international competition. Uh, so I think the green strategy is uh, still there, and I, 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 I think in the long run, uh, probably there won't be uh, that big changes. Yeah. All right. Uh, question from Professor. Yeah. Uh, uh, if we could wait for the mic, just to get to uh, uh, Hold on. Thanks. Uh, U.S. has uh, U.S. has now so-called reshoring, reshoring a uh, program. You know, bring those. Uh, in manufacture industry back. Uh, on, on the other hand, uh, the uh, the President Biden just signed the so-called the Chips Act. So my question is that in terms of the uh, the, the the chip industries, you know, uh, you know the the Morris, the, the former chairman of the TSMC, actually he's not he he. If my mem if my reading is correct, he's not quite uh, optimistic because for a long time now. Uh, the U.S. is focused on the service uh, industry than the manu manufacturing industry. So, how how do you assess, you know, the uh, this kind of a uh, with the Chip Act and the to what extent, you know, the uh, the real uh, the so-called indigenous uh, uh, manufacturing capability and the, the future development, and future R&D, uh, how how would be feasible? So. 
do you want to try oh, to talk about okay. that? Uh, I'll try. Okay. Uh, um, well, I think the, uh, the semicon semiconduct uh, industry is currently very global. I, I believe it involves probably more than 100 countries, if you think about the whole chain. Uh, but just the industry itself is very concentrated on uh, Taiwan, uh, Japan, South Korea, and Netherlands, and the U.S. Uh, uh, so I think with the Chip and Science Act, the U.S. wants to indigenize uh, the production of the chips. I, I, uh, and I also, uh, as also mentioned that uh, because of the cost uh, to move back uh, those factories uh, and to produce in the U in the U.S. So it's, it's actually very high. So I'm not quite sure this is a wise decision. Uh, but I understand that the U.S. really uh, needs to, uh, because, uh, because China is somehow developing itself uh, sufficient strategy, so the U.S. has to do that. But I, I think, uh, and somehow, probably an alternative is to, uh, again, like reinforce the importance of Chip War, uh, Chip War Alliance. And uh, uh, so the U.S. still hold uh, the intellectual property uh, uh, to, uh, 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 like, like uh, those innovations uh, uh, of, the, of the upper uh, stream industry, the uh, software. Uh, the U.S. still has uh, its uh, comparative advantage, but for the production, uh, it can still uh, be on the the soil of uh, of its allies. Uh, but just the, the the problem is that uh, right now there are quite a lot of things that are producing in China, and China is uh, because China's market is sort of uh, is it, is big, so. Uh, there is a possibility. I, I'm, I'm not quite sure whether it's right. It's not right now, but I, I'm not quite sure whether, whether after generations, the, 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 uh, China it might be able to uh, be self-sufficient in some way. Uh, so the U.S. definitely need to think about that way. So, so my 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 thing is that uh, the, the U.S. Can, U.S. can still have the upper uh, stream, uh, uh, the the advantage, but the production are still in its allies. Uh, and, but those allies might still might need to rethink its relationship with China. Yeah, that's just some thoughts. No, I think it's a good answer. I, I don't, I'm not an expert enough in, in semiconductor production to know kind of what it takes to be a winner in that, in that sector. Um, but I think that, um, uh, you know, I think that clearly, um, there is a, um, I mean, to me, it's all a question of balance. It's like we, we don't and probably shouldn't or can't afford uh, to produce all of the semiconductors we need. And by the way, there's a sort of follow-on question is uh, we don't maybe make a lot of the things into which the semiconductors go. Where are those made? So there's another set of questions about where, where, you know, what we're going to do with all these semiconductors if we do make them. But it does feel to me like you know, some investment in that capability, uh, despite the upstream, you know, advantage that we may have, um, uh, you know, is, you know, as, a, as just as a citizen looking at this, objectively trying to look at this, it seems like it makes sense for us to have some capability in this space and production itself produces its own, you know, spin-off benefits. The R&D part is, is, is useful. It seems that our semiconductor industry genuinely feels this will be helpful and important to their ability to continue to produce the, um, you know, the, 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 the chips that, that we all need. Um, and so, uh, so I, I mean, you know, 52 billion is, a, or 53, I guess it now is the number we're supposed to say, um, is, uh, you know, is, is a big number on one hand, but it's a drop in the bucket, you know, next to the cost of, of actually producing uh, these things at a mass scale. So I, I guess I would say I don't think this is going to by itself solve the problem. I also don't think it's going to fundamentally uh, shift uh, the patterns of production around the world. I think it's a marginal um, in investment in, uh, in, a, in a capability that it feels like we ought to have some capability in. Um, and, uh, and the R&D that goes with it, I think, is useful um, in a broader, you know, the, the, the uh, externalities. Um, the benefits of that could be could be broader 
uh, than it appears. I mean, we made a relatively, I think, smaller investment in the 1980s when we set up Semitech, you know, with, with 16 or whatever the U.S. government set up with 16 uh, semiconductor uh, companies to, you know, to take on the J Japan challenge at the, in the day. And, you know, that wasn't a huge investment either, but it was significant enough that it turned the balance and gave the U.S. a capability here uh, in this space. So I'm sort of willing to believe that this could be helpful beyond the, you know, beyond the numbers or the logic that you kind of imply in your question. Um, you know, so I think it's, it's a, you know, it makes sense to me as a public policy. Great. Well, we've got a, a question from the online audience, uh, and we do have some time for a, maybe one more question after this, um, but this is from Kevin, so thank you, Kevin. Uh, can you place this conversation of China's economic engagement in the region uh, with respect to its domestic structural difficulties, such as the middle income trap, rising inequality, debt, et cetera? What does this relationship look like? So I guess the, the, the nexus of China's ambitions in the development sphere contrasting with its own domestic uh, situation. Chelsea, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, I think uh, ch uh, right now there are actually th uh, two kinds of thoughts within the Chinese aspirants. One is more about self-sufficiency and one is more about integration with the uh, Indo-Pacific uh, region and, uh, and, uh, and, and all, all, all countries all, all over the world. Uh, uh, but the question is asking whether uh, uh, there is, uh, China is using like so, some kind of deflection uh, p uh, strategy to deflect its domestic problems to, you know, uh, to engage you know, with the uh, Indo-Pacific region. Um, well, I, I, I think you, you don't need to use uh, econom uh, international economic integration to deflect uh, your own domestic problem. Uh, uh, I, I would say that um, uh, Within the Chinese policy circles, uh, Xi Jinping himself might be more in the camp of a self-sufficiency. But still, at the same time, uh, you, would say, you would think that uh, cr uh, still keeping some kind of economic uh, uh, engagement uh, and relationship with, uh, with the Indo-Pacific countries can uh, keep uh, itself uh, and some economic leverage to, to uh, achieve national goal. Uh, so I, th I, I really think that these two things are integrated with each other, but it's probably not more about the deflection of the domestic problem, but it's more about achieving a more rejuvenation of the nation uh, and more nationalist goal to make China uh, great again or, or something like that. So it, it's, uh, it's more about Xi Jinping's uh, ambitious strategy to uh, just uh, to still keeping a great relationship, economic relationship with the region in order to keep its leverage. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great question, Kevin, and, and important to this conversation um, because I think we in Washington had sort of developed this sense that somehow China was this unstoppable behemoth with, you know, with, with this 10% um, a year growth that was going to, you know, take over all these, um, sectors and then push its economic um, power out and, and win every battle um, in that regard. And I think, you know, the reality that has come home to roost is that, it, that it's actually maybe not as, um, China's not as economically strong as we thought it would. There are now people saying, you know, it's not going to overtake us in, in um, even by market exchange rates in, um, in uh, GDP, at least not as soon as, as, as people thought. And, you know, again, the, sort of my soundbite on this is I'd much rather have U.S. economic problems than Chinese ones. Um, you know, China's got, you know, still hundreds of millions of people who are living on, you know, but, uh, you know minimal amounts of income. Um, they've got enormous environmental problems, financial strains, um, you know, and, and don't have the, the, the resources and the other advantages that the U.S. has. Um, peaceful borders, a lot of other things we've we've got advantages in, and an innovation, you know, culture that continues to be robust. And you know, immigration is challenging, but we still, you know, benefit from that in a way China really doesn't. So there's, I just would much rather have our problems than theirs. And I do think it's important for us to have a realistic view of what China's capable of doing. And and you've seen it reflected in, um, actually, both maybe their their Belt and Road 
um, profile, which you know for a while was very ambitious, and, and you saw sort of Belt and Road pushing out everywhere. It was exaggerated even then by us and them, but but it's really been pulled back and, and redirected, maybe towards more digital stuff than than sort of the big heavy dirty stuff. Um, but uh, but they've really I think pulled in their horns for a lot of reasons there. And then on the other hand, the coercion that China continues to exert is maybe more confirmation of this, that they're not feeling as strong and confident at home. They, they're using you know, economic coercion as a, as a, as a tool of um, you know, trying to maintain domestic stability, legitimacy that, that would otherwise be produced through strong growth and rising incomes. Um, and you know, they don't have as much of that as they had, so they have to push out in other ways and challenge every, you know, every Chinese character on a door in an in a, in a Eastern European country um, you know, because, because it's, it's potentially going to question their, their legitimacy. So, so, so I think there are signs that China, I don't mean China is going to fail, and God forbid, by the way. I mean, if you think a strong China is a problem for the United States, imagine a failing China, <laughs> how much of a problem that would be. So nobody wants that. I'm not predicting that. Um, I think the worst case, and I'm a Japan guy who was there in the 90s, you know, is you get a sort of lost decade, and, and that's, I think, not impossible, that China, you know, doesn't substantially grow. Uh, you know, the difference with Japan is Japan was already rich when that happened, um, and number two, Japan is democracy, and they tossed the LDP out um, after a couple of years and came back, but, but they did toss them out. I think that was a reflection of people's unhappiness with that economic state of affairs. And uh, that's not an option in China, so, so I'm not saying it would be a happy thing for them, but I think that's a more likely scenario than a failing China, um, and even that's not likely. But, um, but I think we should be considering the possibility of a, of a slower, less a slower growing, less confident China. Thanks for your answers. That was that was excellent. Um, there's no more. I have I have one more. Uh, if no one else in the room does, because um, we have about five more minutes. So uh, I guess keep it on the shorter side. But um, so I'm curious. You know, with new or relatively new leaders in Washington, Tokyo, and Seoul, um, it appears that there are stronger prospects for a renewed U.S. Japan ROK trilateral uh, cooperation than there have been in, in many years, uh, several years at least. So I'm curious what the implications for Taiwan of a renewed trilateral relationship uh, is in, in your view, uh, Chelsea. Yeah, um, yeah, again, I think Taiwan will welcome this kind of development. Uh, well, I, I think particularly for Japan, as you mentioned, that uh, there was a, a Japanese experts has a, lots of uh, incentives to have more cooperation, economic cooperation with, with the U.S. Uh, and I also, I think uh, the recent uh, crisis across the Taiwan Strait really pushed uh, Japan uh, to work closer with the U.S. and to and even Taiwan. Uh, so, so some people may, may say it's uh, like a Finnish effect that uh, the Finland tried to uh, join NATO after uh, the Ukraine war. war. Uh, so I think Japan is right now probably uh, in that kind of a uh, trend. Uh, but, but, but if we think about South Korea, I think South Korea might have a different kind of story. Because uh, if we think about the very strong economic relationship between South Korea and, and, and China, and also the fact that uh, South Korea's president uh, didn't choose to visit Pelosi uh, when she visited there. Uh, that actually uh, reflects the fact that uh, South Korea is very cautious about not angering, angering uh, China when cooperating with, uh, with the U.S. So I think this kind of uh, trilateral uh, say negotiation or like leadership uh, well, we'll have some prospects, but there are also uh, some difficulties uh, uh, probably uh, between them that needs to be resolved in the future. Yeah, yeah certainly there, there are still some difficulties on multiple spokes of that trilateral. Um, I do find it encouraging, uh, you know, despite not visiting the speaker, you know, a lot of Yoon's rhetoric towards, you know, U.S. initiatives has been 
encouraging in, in certain ways. But uh, Matt, if yeah, I mean, just very quickly again, I'm an economist, so I don't really look at the at the history issues or the political security issues. But just as an economic proposition, it's sort of a no-brainer <laughs> that the U.S., Japan, and Korea ought to be, you know, working together on economic um, initiatives. And um, you know, we're so aligned in terms of our interests, our values, our, our, our approach to rulemaking and norm setting in this space, and we've got a lot to build on. Um, and then our capabilities technologically are, are aligned. Um, so I think that we ought to be, you know, it's, it's very good news for, uh, for the United States, for the region, I think for Taiwan, <laughs> that the U.S., Korea, and Japan are, are working together more, uh, more effectively if that, if that turns out to be the case, which I hope it will. All right. Well, thank you so much for an excellent hour and a half uh, in the hot seat uh, to the two of you. Um, really appreciate you joining us. Uh, and uh, I think to close us out for the day, we have some closing remarks by President Lai. Yeah, first, <coughs> uh, first of all, OK, can everybody hear me? It's good. It's good. It's on. It's, good. it's green. Okay. Yeah. First of all, I would like to thank again uh, for the uh, the CNS uh, hosting this uh, very important dialogue with us. Um, <clears throat> and f judging from today's live conversation as well as the spontaneity, I think it goes uh, without saying that uh, there's no substitute for a live conversation like this. Uh, this cannot be replicated in the online discussions. So really glad and, uh, and fortunate that uh, we are having uh, this conversation uh, with uh, uh, CNS. So thank you again, and thank you very much. And second, I think uh, in today's uh, discussion, we have a focus on two things. The first panel is about the CCP 20th National Congress, implication for U.S.-Taiwan-China relations. From Taiwan's side, uh, the, uh, today in uh, about the CCP 20th National Congress, is all? Looks on. This is the appraisal operation by the <laughs> 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 <Yes>. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. thanks for, for uh, solving this issue for us. <laughs> the, uh, <coughs> the 20th na uh, CCP National Congress, of course, we all uh, folk, uh, uh, pay very important um, attention to the CCP the National Congress. But uh, uh, in today's world, especially the October 16th, the 20th National Congress presents several anxiety for Taiwan. First of all, we do know that the uh, Xi Jinping sort of reversed everything that uh, the uh, from previous Hu Jintao administration regarding the, uh, the issue on Taiwan. And then we gradually to notice that the Xi Jinping reversed everything that Deng Xiaoping built upon for China in terms of reform and opening. And so that uh, with the third term of the Xi Jinping office, we do not know how that uh, those trends and the development will be. And would that uh, uh, make Xi Jinping more uh, an adventure, adventurous uh, in the, uh, the policy goal he wanted to pursue, uh, that the issue about the great regeneration of the Chinese nations? And we also noticed that the, uh, in Xi Jinping's view, the, uh, uh, the unification with Taiwan or annexation of Taiwan is uh, one of the key elements for him to achieve the uh, great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, not uh, the when he uh, after he achieved this rejuvenation, and then he wanted to uh, unify with Taiwan. So that the add up about the uh, the urgency about the issue that possibly what China would do about Taiwan, and then with uh, Xi Jinping uh, the current action and right now the third term, no one is actually there to stop him. And uh, with the issue that we look at, the Putin's launch the war against Ukraine, and I think the anxiety on Taiwan is particularly high. But then second, the issue uh, about uh, associated with those is that um, many of the elite politics that are not just about Xi Jinping himself and also the, the domestic uh, dynamics, we also witness a very different China from now on. We do know that uh, Xi Jinping, in Xi Jinping's term, that uh, every, every year Chinese economic uh, growth number uh, declined and uh, in a very steep uh, 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 the slope that we notice. So that some of us started to wonder that the, the, the kind of economic momentum for China, uh, what is happening there? And also the future for, and for China does not seem to be very bright. And then uh, the, uh, it's not just about the, the weakening China and how the military uh, will do about Taiwan. It's also about the weakening of China, how it will affect the whole world, and how we're going to adjust our economic model uh, for Taiwan. 
So that is another issue that for Taiwan for, for future sustainable development that uh, people have in mind. And today we come here, uh, thanks for the great conversation that we have uh, uh, with uh, Jake and uh, uh, Arthur Dean and also the, uh, the lively uh, participation from the audience uh, versus online. So that we come here with a lot of questions, but uh, we uh, come with uh, more questions and issues that we need to think about uh, when we leave uh, this room. And the second panel we just had, and uh, we could notice that uh, the high quality of those uh, discussions that we just had uh, regarding the uh, Indo-Pacific economic, uh, political economy order. I think the, uh, this panel sort of uh, act as an extension of the what we had last year. I remember last year when we had with the CNAS, uh, one of the key issues that, the, that in Taiwan side, we wanted to uh, pose the question regarding the new political economy order is that uh, uh, when we look at the, the already existing economic arrangement in the region, uh, none of them actually uh, address the issue about supply chain resilience and the safety and security issues. And uh, we not, about not just about the supply chain security and uh, resilience issue that needs to be addressed, but also how are we going to deal with the digital economy that's going to dominate the whole world uh, from, the, uh, from the years to come, especially the pandemic is actually accelerating uh, the kind of the uh, electro ele ele uh, electromagnetic tool that's necessary for the, uh, the future, the digital economy. So that we are going to witness the, the coming of age of digital economy faster than we anticipated. And so those issues, uh, when we talk about the post-pandemic, is going to be uh, place a very urgent uh, mission for us to solve. And today, uh, thanks for the uh, uh, great uh, discussion by our panelists, that uh, we have some idea, but of course more questions, but that is a great issue that uh, for the food of thoughts uh, for all of us uh, going back to ponder. So uh, uh, in concluding, thanks again for a, a great conversation that we had today and also for the CNES and uh, not to mention about the uh, live participant participation from our, uh, the people in the audience as well as online. So thank you very much. <laughs>